Guys, intro time. Wait, which intro? The wisdom check. Oh, good. Wait, no. I thought we were keeping the old intro. What's wrong with the old one? People like that one. It was too long. Yeah. Too many fucking gifts. Yeah. 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 But can we keep the part where I yell <gasps> more? Oh, no. 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 But it's the intro to end all intros. I got like what? Two lines last time? Do you want more lines, Tim? Well, no, not really. <laughs> In a world without answers. Uh, yeah. Wait, do you want to start with that? Here we go. Exactly like last time. Wait, OK, so we're doing the exact same way. Let's start with the smoky bar. No, yeah. no, it's a new season. We have to have a new intro. More. Yeah. Not sure why we thought this would go any differently. Oh, well. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the Wisdom Check, where Jeff and Dustin welcome a guest every week to talk about Dungeons and Dragons. Welcome. This is ridiculous. I'm starting the stream now. Wait, wait, where's my die at? Well, we can't start until I botch. and It's not an intro unless I'm botching. You're on. And we should be live with that one right there. So... Hello and welcome once again to the Wisdom Check. I'm Jeff, and across the way from me over there is Dustin. Hey, welcome everybody. Good to have everyone here tonight. So we are situated in for tonight, looking to solve some of your problems. So we're kind of digging back into what the Wisdom Check started off as, kind of looking at things that you may have questions about, things that have come up in your games, Maybe you have a character you're trying to work on, you're trying to figure out how to fix a background a certain way, something of that nature. If you got something, we're eager to dig into it and kind of uh, help you piece it together. So uh, while we kind of listen in and wait for something from you guys, um, oh, we already have a question, amazingly. Uh, you wanna read this one, Dustin? I has a question. My nephew is seven years old. What's a good TTRPG to get him for Christmas? Oh boy. Man. Um, I know I saw them when I was at Gen Con, which was over a year ago now. And I know you were there too, Jeff. Mm -hmm. They have put out a line of D&D books, official D&D books that are geared for younger kids. God, what were those called? Um, I'm blanking on it completely. They, they, were, they were Dungeons and Dragons. They, just had, they were just a redesign of the books. Mm -hmm. And I know that our friend, the Litching Hour, was working with uh, Star Kids or something, which was a TTRPG that was also being um, created right. directly for kids. And he was helping back that for a while. Mm -hmm. I don't know whatever came of it, but those are the two off the top of my head. If you were going to start them with a more adult TTRPG, I almost would lean towards something like Kids on Bikes. Because yeah, if you're smaller. dealing with kids, they, they take on the role of a kid, which is mm -hmm. easier for them to understand because it puts them into something they know and they understand easier. You can tell mm -hmm. stories at their level using a system that's built for things that are their level. If, aside from that, maybe lean towards one of the superhero ones because most kids understand superheroes and they like right. big power fantasy. So <laughs> you can go with something that's big power fantasy, you know, like without getting into the, the nuance of fantasy characters that are likely maybe more fragile you can have them play the kind of superheroes that they see on tv you can literally even make the the heroes that they see in their comics or in their cartoons and let them play as those mm -hmm. so those would be my suggestions for how to get younger kids started versus going with a straight D. &D. yeah i think one of the big concerns you're going to have is uh you know the, the kids are going to have a certain level of understanding of mathematics and while yeah. we don't really think of the game having that serious of math uh, you know, if, if you're a young enough kid, you may not know how to add and subtract yet. So <laughs> like, uh, anything like that's going to be a little complicated. I would say, you know, you might want to do something uh, simple, like you were saying, like the, the, the tri-stat systems usually are pretty simple. You know, you got like three stats, you just roll die, you put that number on there, you can help them with addition, numbers are small, and you just play the narrative. But just kind of breaking the ice on what it is to do uh, kind of improvisational storytelling and making decisions as a character, and then getting the notion of like what it is to have like a, a die roll kind of impact what you're doing. That's the, it's, it's weird, because with kids, they already are good at playing pretend. Mm -hmm. 
it's adults trying to get in there that you have to get them to role play again. <laughs> Kids will role play automatically. Like yep. it's a natural, normal form of their everyday play. Mm-hmm. What's what's hard to get them to do is to understand the limitations of a system. Yes. So mm-hmm. you can't get them to understand the limitations of a system. You get an adult, they understand the limitations of a system. They understand math. They don't understand how to be someone not themselves. So like mm-hmm. that takes a little while. Like it, it, there, I don't know what the, I don't know if that's why the teenage years is like such a sweet spot for like gaming where it's like <laughs> people get into it because that's like when you're kind of still in that like you're just coming out of one phase and like heading into another and like mm-hmm. the amount of math you need and the amount of of uh, that stuff is still kind of all there. So mm-hmm. maybe that's the middle school heading into high school is kind of like the sweet spot for picking up gaming for the first time. But mm-hmm. um, I know when I ran my kids through a game session recently. Like we, I had to really, really water down the 5e rules for a couple of my kids just because of their age. Right. So mm-hmm. I made it super simple. Um, you could pick up something like tiny dungeons, which is all just D sixes. Mm-hmm. If you know, numbers one to six, you know, get some dice that have the actual numbers on them and not the dots. And, um, you know, that'd be, that'd be easy for a younger kid, mm-hmm. uh, you know, five, six, seven year old to pick up and play. Cause it's all D sixes, which you probably have laying around the house. And if you get a couple specialty ones, so they don't have to try to count dots. Mm-hmm. I Unless guess you like, want to count the dots. Like, well, yeah, that's a way of doing it. I guess one right. question you said, this is a, for a seven year old, um, you said nephew. So are, are you going to be running the games for your nephew or is this something you're buying for your nephew that somebody else is going to have to learn to run? Cause that, that might kind of skew how we might advise you here. Cause like, if you're going to be running it, we can come up with all kinds of like ideas how to bridge the gaps between, you know, a, you know, adult level of complexity to a child. Whereas if you're trying to teach somebody else to run a game that they may not already play, to then make a a different version of it, that's going to be a little tricky. It looks like she said Mama won't like too much dark and insanity reference in the D and D, so he's really mm. he's really creative. I would say lean towards superheroes and mm-hmm. find a find a find a system that superheroes that'll let them do what they want to do. Um, you know, I wouldn't, I don't know if I would go anything as weird and complicated as the old Marvel, like D100 system, because that thing is a little wonky to figure out. Like, uh, um, kind of. I mean, if you look at it as you control. have a number, just be below it. And then you just look at the chart and you say, that's the number is here. What color is it? Maybe it's not yeah, too bad. I, I just think that it was, um, it was a, ra- it gave you like ranges of success, which is probably harder for a seven year old to manage and figure than a hard yes or no success where you get something like tiny dungeons or you get something like um, trying to think of other, like I think in mutants and masterminds, like it's a, you roll against this, you succeed or you don't succeed. Whereas mm-hmm. in Marvel, it's like you kind of succeed, you mostly succeed, you really right. succeed. Like, so it was like, you had to like kind of really gauge what that meant. Like there's a lot of interpretation there on the GM DMs part. And if this is something that you're talking to make a seven year old may play with friends or something like that. Like if you have an adult running it, then sure you can run any system because mm-hmm. you're just taking the sheets and saying, roll these dice and they never have to understand any more of it than that. But well, if you're talking about giving them a gift that they might play with friends, you need something they can yeah, that's different. reliably look at and understand. So. Yeah. I mean, if you're just doing it between uh, yourself and your, and your nephew, then like you could even do something like we did with LARP, right? You could do rock, paper, scissors. And if the character's supposed to be good at something, they win on a tie. And if they're bad at something, they also lose on the tie. And they just yeah, just go with just that. Make, just make sure they understand they have to declare the bomb. <laughs> start down, um, start down, and declare. I had to teach that to Riker. We were at rock paper scissors. There, I was like, no, you start down. He's like, huh? I'm like, down. Start down. Yeah, there you go. Um, yeah, so I mean, that's a way to do it. Uh, there's there's bound to be other ways to do it, but like maybe um, maybe just taking like a board game almost, you know, that has some room for kind of wiggly kind of decision making that kind of stuff and then just adding the role play on top of it just kind of as a bridge to get into it um, if you get if you get two to three hundred expendable dollars just go find old hero quest <laughs> one of the right. remaining boxes of that out there i mean that that was so perfect like how has yeah. that never really made a comeback is beyond me like they needed like hero quest version 2.0 like mm-hmm. i don't know maybe descent is kind of like that but but like yeah. hero quest was that it was that bridge between board games and, and role playing games for me. And mm-hmm. I owned it and had a really good time with it. And it got, I know it definitely played a factor into me getting into other uh, tabletop and other RPGs. For so. sure. 
Um, yeah, and I guess it really comes down to what you're trying to get out of the experience. Uh, obviously, you know, if you're just you're just trying to create a fun experience, but you know, if you're if you're looking to teach while you play, that's going to require a different kind of set of uh, materials and games and, and emphasis on certain things. Uh, and, and complexity then becomes maybe a lesson, you know, like so adding and subtracting. If you keep the numbers simple, maybe that's like where they learn how to do that stuff, uh, which could be kind of neat. Because uh, we've talked a lot about that in the past, you know, where gaming did a lot for, for us, you know, like adding to our vocabulary, adding our problem solvings, and then obviously reinforce some basic math stuff that, you know, comes in handy everywhere. Uh, so th that may be something to go into. But yeah, I, I think you're going to have to look for specifically designed for children games. Uh, and I know there are tons of them because like every time, like Dustin was saying, we go to a convention, there's, there's a whole market of that now. It's trying to like hit that next generation of people. So um, I don't know any off the top of my head and I can't pull up any screens right now without ruining the stream. So <laughs> I can't do a quick search for you, but um, I'm sure they're out there. They've got to be. And all else fails, you could probably strip down fifth edition to some like basic sets of rules, you know, like cut out some complex things like, you know, feats or um, I don't know, just limit the number of choices they have to make. And I don't think that's too hard. It just all depends on the kid. Yeah. I mean, you, if you know the kid well enough, you know the things they're into. Like I said, that's why I would probably lean just towards superheroes. Like every kid understands it. It's mm -hmm. easy for them to get into. They don't even have to create a new one. They can just take one right out of the book they like. You help them build it in the system or whatever and just let them run with it. You know, they'll think that every kid who owns action figures already is half a step away from from being a role player like and, and every kid has them you know my kid does he, he he played one game with his brother and sister but like then when you let him go you know he's up there with his up there with his uh you know supermans and his batmans and stuff playing around or mm -hmm. you know it's i think that's just the easiest way to do it really yeah that's perfect debbie that's the whole point of tonight so if you got questions you got things you want to get into uh do exactly that bring it up with this because uh, again, if you weren't here with this when we started, our whole goal right now is that we're wanting to take questions from you all, things that you're dealing with, things you want to figure out within the tabletop role playing world, uh, and we'll kind of workshop with you. So, like, if you know, we did this uh, early on in uh, some of our earlier episodes where we help people kind of write their background a little bit, kind of like teasing them through things. Uh, we've done things like, you know, helping people figure out their voices. Um, you know, we've, we've talked about how to kind of like set up plots a little bit, make NPCs, like all these different things. So if you have those sorts of questions, we'll dig into it. And uh, it's, it's a good day to do it because next week is our final episode of the Wisdom Check. So yeah. next week's going to be a lot of flashbacks. <laughs> I think. Yeah, we got a whole we got a whole like two years worth of Wisdom Checks to just kind of recap on and talk mm -hmm. about highlights, low lights and, you know some of yeah. the fun stuff we've done on this show over two years and all the great guests we've had on like that'll be next week so yeah that's what you look forward to so this is kind of like last call for questions yeah so we've had a lot of good questions come up from chat over time no matter what topic we decided we were bringing to the table we've always <laughs> we've always taken the topics from chat and try to make them priority as well so absolutely uh so i saw some of your players are in here so uh that's true yeah. at least one two we got two in here right now at least yeah, pretty but deadly. Uh, not deadly. Pretty, pretty, pretty but nerdy. But nerdy uh, was talking about how you killed her character uh, in. That's in not Hander. true. Is that not I true? Didn't, I didn't kill anybody. Oh, okay, all right. They all live. They all live to see another day. I, I asked uh, how the Zweihander game go, and uh, they said terrible. I died. Hmm. Per, per, pretty but nerdy did not die. <laughs> all right. I did. Kill, I did kill a character this week, but it was off stream. Sorry. Sorry about y'all. Um, He's a he's a merciless DM or storyteller. Now, or GM or okay, whatever. so just to tell the story, <laughs> yeah, he, I, I I did it. Yes, but a, another player was wanting to help, but didn't want to get down off the carriage, mm. and she had recently pledged herself to a demon, the wretched one. Who you know, you met the wretched one. Nice fellow. F wonderful fella loves warm hugs yep. super friendly demon um so she's got a dark passenger as a flaw oh boy. and so every once in a while she can call upon the dark passenger to help her out well she didn't want to get down there because she was afraid of getting killed because it was a three-way fight over some esoteric materials on a on a wagon on its way to huttenberg 
can't imagine what's in those boxes, right, Jeff? I don't know um, what or who. It, yeah. It's yeah, weird. yeah, exactly. So they were having this three-way fight over these materials, and uh, she didn't want to get down there. She was afraid of getting killed. So uh, without any other action she could take, um, I said, well, do you want to call upon your dark passenger? She was like, yes, enthusiastically. So I flipped open to her spell list, and I said, okay, well, you feel a rumbling in your stomach, and you let loose a feces fetter spell. God. Which is just a really, 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 it's a spell but it's a really, really nasty fart. And so yeah. everyone around had to make a toughness check upon which her ally failed and became helpless. Oh, and the boy. one bandit who passed was right. The one that was fighting him. So then that bandit just spent the one AP and killed rabbit. <laughs> and that so then she felt super horrible that she hopped down out there and had to finish killing the other bandit. Wow. And, then, uh, and yeah, what other so game can you have that scenario occur? A silent but deadly. It was, yeah, I mean, I mean you gotta love, that's why I love about Zweihander. It has these crazy things in there. Like, you don't get that in a D&D game. Like, Stinking I mean, Cloud is the closest thing you get to mm -hmm. it, but even Stinking Cloud doesn't describe itself literally as Flash. Yeah, uh, yeah it's, that's a special circumstance. And I'm, I'm really curious, uh, was this a player you've you played with in the past? Is this somebody who's new to role-playing? Oh, uh, he's my, uh, he's one of my best friends. Okay. I killed one of my best friends' characters this week, and, um, I killed his character in Bitter Harvest. So he's a two times Y hand or death person. Yeah, now. He's two times white. yeah, yeah. So I mean I'm you know, I'm actually him and the the player who cast the spell were the two that died in Bitter Harvest the first time I ran it. So Wow. Well, I was so, going to say, it, how did they deal with death? And like, what was that they experience made, like? They made, new they made new characters is what they did. <laughs> right away? <laughs> All right. No, this time they didn't. This time, uh, as you know, as a person who was in Horror and Huttenberg, I have a bit of an out the first time this happens to mm -hmm. a character. So they're going to experience that next game. I won't spoil it. Those of you who watched Horror and Huttenberg, mm -hmm. um, you know, here on the channel knows knows what I'm talking about. So they'll get to experience that next game and that bit of piece of plot will drop on them because of it. That um, happens early <laughs> in their run. Yeah, was, this was effectively game one for you guys. Like They didn't mm -hmm. get this far before tragedy happened to them. So, um, yeah. So, I, mean, I, I don't pull punches. No. Nope. No. Nope. Well, we almost uh, had a fatality in our first game, too. But I guess yeah. the, the, the root of the question was, you know, like, how did your players deal with that? Because that's such a like a really random event, right? Like it is. <laughs> um, well, <laughs> it was so it's a they're very OK. So I'm the I'm the GM for that group. Mm -hmm. And my, my buddy Josh is the only one that I know prior to running Bitter Harvest for them. He and them are, however, are all kind of friends and kind of all know each other. So they're already like friends and I'm like kind of the stranger of the group and they're getting to know me better, but like, that's just how it goes. So, um, so when he went down to the spell, which she did not decide to cast, I decided to cast it. Remember it was me as the GM picked the spell and said, this is the effect that's going to happen because you called on your dark passenger. Mm -hmm. Um, so he just, he was, he was kind of razzing her a bit about it. Uh, he was like, "Oh, if I die to a fart, so help me!" <laughs> like you know, oh, he was no. like, <laughs> and then she was like devastated. She was like almost in tears. She was like, "No, I can't believe this is going to happen." She felt so bad. <laughs> so that is, that is incredible. Uh, I mean, we've <laughs> been dealing with a lot of fatalities in our "Don't Sleep" game. That's uh, true. And Air Lasers asking us how many fatalities we have in that game. And I'm let's trying let's to not use the word. Let's not use the word "we." This uh, is not well, a weak okay, question. Fine, yeah, fine. Very... you're not part of the team. You don't count. This is, this is, a, this is, a, this is a you. This is a you guys problem for for right now. Um, give me one more game. I think I can get Duke dead. But for right now, I'm still on my original character. <laughs> All right. So, well, Dustin hasn't lost a character yet, even though he's he's got a space ripped off by a zombie. So he he's still on original character. So he's he's. I can only die in downtime. That. I can uh, only die in downtime now. As long as we don't go to downtime, we're good. I can. Now, I can now speaking of death during downtime. Clint lost a character at a game he wasn't at, and That's then he true. came back, and then I think the very next game he lost a character, or like the next couple of games. Uh, two, well, we've only we've only had five games, so yep. I mean, if you're on character three, none of your characters live more than two games. So I that's mean, right. So yeah, that's, he's lost two. Yeah, he's lost two. Cameron's lost one. I've lost one. Tim lost one. You've Tim lost one. It's just the five. Are we only on no. death five? No, uh, I, I I was there last session, mm -hmm. and I did not have to use my birthday immunity, <laughs> but I had it. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a I, powerful gimmick. Yeah, 
I don't know how you've survived, but I guess by being the guy with the gun. (laughs) But yet the gun has been the least useful thing that I've used. Like, Yeah, but if you have the gun, you're usually somewhere far away trying to use the gun, right? Whereas the rest of us are like, oh, God, I got a pull stick. And, uh, you know, we're up in the the thick of things. (laughs) (laughs) I did try to die really hard on my birthday last year. You're right, early. That's true. This year I have a... it, it, my here's the biggest problem with birthday immunity. I'm going to go on a birthday immunity rant for a minute. Oh, okay. So it is both the best and worst gimmick of all time because one, it's a fantastic gift from your DM to decide not to kill you on your birthday. It, however, then inspires you to get the rest of your party killed. <laughs> so it's like the biggest dick move in the history of dick moves also. Cause you're like, I ain't going to die. So then you have to like reel it back in and then you end up not really fully using it because like Duke was on a counter surrounded by zombies when the game started. Like I could have just decided to go Duke nuke him on him and like just grab something blunt and just start beating in zombie heads. Mm -hmm. But then I would have ended the game with like one hit point. I'd have been in thick Tony territory and walking into a game I no longer have immunity in where any one hit could kill me. So I decided just to play it safe and play it smart and I got the rafters and then I used uh, some MacGyvering and I electrocuted a bunch of zombies. Mm Mm-hmm. So, you know, it, I mean, I didn't use the immunity. Like, they never hit me. They tried and they missed. So, yeah, it, was, it worked it out. Yeah. I don't know how we all survived that game anyway. Uh, I just edited it up and it'll be up tomorrow. But you'll Hopefully. have to watch that and see what's going on with it. Um, Air Laser and all that actually did ask us a question specifically with the Wizard well, Shack question. So, uh, how do you deal with Roll20 talking over each other issues? Since you can't have side scenes like an in real life table, especially with a new group of players. Um, yeah, this is a real tricky I thing. I don't, I, I don't ever feel like it's a problem that much. Hmm. Um, I feel like I miss, I miss having like sidebar conversations, mm-hmm. but I don't feel like it's a talking over each other issue as much. Well, technically, it has to be right. Like the reason why we don't do it is because in order to have a side scene conversation right. with our no. voices. We can't right. do it over the top of our DM. So, like, I think that's the, right. the root of our question here. Um, and I, I guess you just... I don't really know how to deal with that outside of having another call or something that you jump into to have your conversation and then jump back in. Um, but, of course, you know, if you're if you're doing a stream like we are where we're capturing cameras and stuff, that instantly becomes an issue. Uh, so, we... we I. I, I think the answer is is that there just has to be a lot of skipping around. I, mm-hmm. I think of it the same way that I think of like a TV show or a movie. Mm-hmm. Like if you if you have a side scene, like you really want the viewers. Like if something important is going to happen in that side scene, which it could, mm-hmm. a conversation between two characters, you probably don't want that left on the editing room floor. Technically, like yeah, it probably right. has a certain amount of value. So you want the you want the audience to hear it as well. So like what you do is is instead of them happening at the same time, you just know that like you're going to like go from one scene and then if a dm is doing their job they'll recognize that there's another scene that needs to take place or you bring it up real quick like and then boom like the next scene happens so Mm -hmm. like i feel like it's kind of a the party typically is not that split but even when they are where a side scene would be necessary i feel like it's um just a scene that happens after the other scene instead of used to do a lot of split things so like in our old games when we were around a table where it was possible just to have a little sidebar conversation we had a lot of them or groups splitting up the dm switching from you know group to group to run whatever they're doing uh so that happened a lot uh whereas in our current setup technologically we're kind of stuck without doing that so i think we've changed our style i don't think it was as much role play there was a lot of strategy talk. There was a lot of that talk going on around a battle map. Like, what were you going to do next? Like, we coordinate our stuff a little better that way versus now, like, I don't know, like, what Jeff is doing until it's Jeff's turn and he reveals what he's doing because he can't tell me without telling the whole crowd and everybody else. Whereas I think we were at a table. It'd be like, um, hey, I'm going to do this over here next. You go do this. I don't know if there was quite as much actual role play, role play side scenes as I think maybe maybe you're thinking like, I don't know if that happened quite as much as, well, I know for, for example, I know Cam and I used to do a lot of the side role playing Barry and I used to do a lot of it. Um, in all of the world of darkness games in particular, I remember different people would pair up while the other person's running a scene 
and they'd be talking. And a lot of times those were in character conversations. Yeah, you can't side scene. I mean, Crazy Axe is not wrong. Like, you absolutely can't when you're on stream. And I guess, yeah. to me, it's more like the Forbidden Fruit Syndrome. Like, when it was available, I'm not positive we used it near as much. But now that we can't, mm -hmm. it's like, you know, I wish I could, but you can't. So, like, I think it was nice to have it as an option at the table. But, like, I'm not positive. I think I was always more paying attention to what was actually going on in the scene that was being run by the DM. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't. I don't feel like I ever really ran as many side side scenes. Like it was a, kind of more of a LARP thing. Like LARP was nothing but side scenes all the time. Like you were always in a side scene to LARP because every scene was a side scene technically. So I felt like that was more of a time when I would do things out on the side was more of those scenarios. I don't recall in our D and D games that ever being heavily heavily used. Um, the World of Darkness games. I don't remember that being really much the case way back then either because we didn't really role play the same as we do with what mm -hmm. like that was pre larp so i i, I, don't I know. know players did it a lot i guess right? i have Salt a different game. memory of those than maybe you do but yeah maybe uh some of the the rest of air laser's question here looks like she's uh clarifying the intent of it a little uh so she's saying uh, a player from their friend group uh is in another group now and they talk over each other a lot and a lot of yelling and talking at the same time after fights because everyone is trying to role play at once so especially in a new group with new players, how do you determine RP order? Um, I, wow. <laughs> I think everyone, just has, everyone has to give each other space. Mm -hmm. Like, I think that's what it boils down to. Like, you have to have a certain amount of mutual respect amongst your peers in the same way that me and you do our best to not talk with podcast. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, we have to give each other space to talk. We have to, we have to give each other space to, like, get our part in and to, and again, this goes back to the question of a side scene or not a side scene is if I'm interested in your character, I want your character to have its time to shine and tell me what its story is. Mm -hmm. If every time your character is under the spotlight, I'm paying no attention because I'm too busy still talking about my character and what my character is doing over here with one other player. Now two of us aren't paying any attention to what Jeff's character is doing. So mm -hmm. for me, I always tried to keep my eye on what was going on in the ball, unless the DM was like trying to pick out loot or something like if it was like oh i gotta set up a battle map then we could all sit there and just talk amongst ourselves while he was setting up or drawing the battle map that's when sure. maybe we would do more of that side role play was when the dm was preoccupied with something technical that he had to do draw a map get a map out get minis on the map when levi had to take time for that we would do we would just talk amongst ourselves sometimes in character sometimes out of character mm -hmm. um, more so than when it was a player's turn or a scene was being ran with a player so for me it's about just giving each other that space and that time and being respectful of that. And it's sometimes players just have to kind of, I guess, figure that part out on their own. Yeah. And I, I'm, I'm thinking about the, the question that that's posed here is to saying that there are actually issues with players wanting to RP over the top of each other. And so not giving each other time. So I, I would think it's the same rules as any other social situation. Like people, talk over each other as a person and in real life they're going to do it in game uh it's rude in both places right so like uh that's just like a social thing but if they need a rule system which i, I can't, it, it it pains me to think that people need a rule system to not talk over each other but if they did uh perhaps a way to do it would be to use charisma stat as like a initiative roster or something uh I wouldn't even go that far with it. Yeah. You have a GM or a DM who is the arbitrator of the game mm -hmm. and should be doing their job and helping create space for each player to have their time. Mm -hmm. And if one player is having a hard time getting anything said or done, a DM needs to stop the other two players, mm -hmm. tell them to hold on a minute, and then focus on that player specifically and work with them on what they're doing so they can get something out and on there and going and then go back to the people who are naturally going to rough shot over the others on their own anyway. But I think you have to draw those hard lines and just make that happen. And mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're running the game at the end of the day. Like you have to run the game. Yeah. But what's odd here, at least from the way the question was posed, it sounds like they're role playing with one another. You know, they're not necessarily talking to like an NPC or doing it a different scene. They're saying like immediately after the fight ends, when people drop back into RP, all the players are talking over each other. Well, I mean, if, yeah. if you're if you're in a dungeon, there's five of us standing in a real life dungeon and we're all there and we get done. We all start talking at one time like that's a real life scenario. 
Mm-hmm. Like it's it's only a problem if it's a problem. Mm-hmm. Like we can all be sitting there cheering, having a having a conversation, you know, three, four, five of us at a time. So if you drop into role play and that's what everyone's doing, it's only a problem if somebody doesn't feel like they get to have a voice at all. And again, mm-hmm. as the GM, then like you have to help create that space for people and you have to help make the other players recognize what they're doing to their fellow player. Like, yeah, if that's really an issue. Like, so again, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, and I don't disagree with, with Ike. It's a bigger problem when it's streamed because then nobody yeah, can understand everything. Mm-hmm. But the people who are in there at the time probably do understand most everything that's getting said and done at the time. The people who are actually involved in it. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. like watching a fight at the bar. Like, <laughs> the people in it know what's going on. No one else does. Like, mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think that's exactly it. If you're at a table, it wouldn't be an issue. Uh, but because right. everyone's playing long distance, or a lot of people are, uh, we're coming into these issues. And and then what the question was talking about it was the DM is also new. Uh, so some of that may just be a lot of strong personalities and the DM needs to step up and be the dominant in the group uh, to kind of <laughs> lay down the law a little bit. Um, but I don't know. It's, it's kind of a... Is, I, th- I think it is just a social issue. Uh, like, if they're talking about random shit, like just like telling jokes and like talking about stuff out in real life, and that's bulldozing in game stuff, then that's a conversation you have uh, with the players and say, "Look, this is this is game time." Um, you know, if you're gonna have those conversations, that's cool, but keep it quiet while we're trying to do RP stuff. Uh, you know, that kind of thing. And that, you know, with any social activity, it's, it can be a little difficult to lay down the law with your peers sometimes, you know, like initially we are getting used to it. And uh, those dynamics are things you got to work through. Yeah. And, and this is uh, another, she's got a follow-up question here. Or a random one, I guess, actually it says, what sort of advice do you have for someone looking to maybe DM, but the group is, uh, that they're taking over is very experienced and the previous DM has set the bar really high. Huh. Maybe there's some stage fright asking for a friend. Okay. so. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying I'm in that spot, but I do role play and run games sometimes for the same group of guys that Levi runs for my friends right here at tabletop to keyboard. I'm going to be doing that pretty soon in a game called I kindred where I'm going to be running vampire, the masquerade for Levi and a few of the other guys. Mm -hmm. So do I feel a certain amount of pressure to, to try to at least get within reaching distance of Levi's DM capabilities? Hell yeah, I do. But it doesn't stop me from doing it. Am I going to get there? No. Hell no. He's a better DM than I am. Don't don't pretend otherwise. Like, but does that prevent me from running games here on the channel for strangers? No. Does it prevent me from running games at my game shop? No. Am I as good a voice actor as Levi? Nope. Uh, do I make maps as well as Levi? Probably not. <laughs> so, like, you know, I I, I, mm-hmm. I am in that spot a lot of times, and I think my answer to you is, is that if they're a good group of players, and if they're experienced players, they will want the opportunity to play and mm-hmm. they will have a good time doing it no matter who's running the game. And I think that's, I think that's what will happen. And I wouldn't, I don't expect anything less from my guys here and I wouldn't expect anything from less from your group either. Like, yeah. And I, I think the other component of that is just, you, you know, that everyone knows you're stepping into the, the new role. Right. And anyone who plays like a sport or something like that, they get on the field with people who are skilled and have been playing for years and they step on the field and expect to be equal. It's not going to happen, but nobody's expecting you to step on the field and be equal. Right. Right. So like, you're going to come out there, you're going to do what you can do. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to learn things. Um, Now I think it's natural to feel a lot of anxiety about that. (laughs) Like I, I don't know very many DMS uh, that go into a game session without anxiety, even Levi, like, if you talk to him ahead of a, a game session, he's freaking out, right? Like, yeah, that's just true. part of it. Like, there's a lot of pressure. For 20 years, he's still freaking out. <laughs> yeah, and so that's just like a, a nature of the beast with uh, running the table. You know, it's you got a lot of people relying on you for a good experience. Uh, and so I think DMs by nature put a lot of pressure on themselves. And when you're trying to compare yourself to other DMs or that you admire, it, it's it's just more imposter syndrome stuff, right? Like. The only way out of that is through. You know, you know who my biggest competition is for me. Who's that? Myself. Yeah, yeah. It should be. Like I sit here now and I'm like, like I got vigilantes of Valandria coming up, and now like 
it was cool when I was doing Terror and Treefell. Nobody knew what to expect, you know. Oh, Dustin's gonna run some Y hander. This ought to be funny. Like, mm-hmm. and boom, Terror and Treefell happens, right? And then I got um, Horn Huntenberg, right? And I come back with Horn Huntenberg, and it was like, well, we saw what he did on Terror and Treefell. That was a pretty decent story. Like, this might be all right. Well, now I've kind of <laughs> completed that one, and that one I think went extremely well. So, like, now yeah, with Vigilantes about well. Landry, I'm like, oh, Lindy's joined us. Speaking yeah, I was gonna say, people, speaking of Huntenberg yeah. game. Um, <laughs> well, so, you one. know, like, so for me, like I got a whole new group of players. Like it's not the same people in each game, but like they all watch part of those games. And now it's like I feel like a pressure to be like, well, I set my own bar. This is what the standard is for me now. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if I don't do voices as well as Levi, I didn't do them as well in the first two games either. So I don't think that's like that's not really my goal. Mm-hmm. But at this point, it's like, man, I gotta. It's like it's like telling the end of a TV show or the third third part of a trilogy where you have to wrap things up and make things come to a conclusion. And so I got to stick the landing on this one. Like this is it. This is the, I got to make all the others matter. And like, how it all has to come together in this last one. So I'm my own worst enemy at this point. Like I hear that. I I hope my players have a good time doing it, but um, that's where I'm at. So (laughs) yeah, for, uh, for those of you joining us tonight, uh, welcome. Uh, Those of you who came with the raid, Uh, we are talking tonight uh, about issues that you all have had as uh, tabletop role players. If you have something that is unresolved, whether it's uh, trying to come up with a character concept, background, voice, dealing with um, social problems at the table, uh, problem players, uh, trying to knock off the, uh, the fear of being a DM, any of these sorts of things, whatever you got that's unresolved for you, bring it to us and we'll try to, you know, Give our two cents I, on it. See if we can help out a little bit. I will say this. Uh, Air Laser says, you know, that everyone else in the group has been DM. So, like, someone needs to step mm-hmm. up. I'll tell you this. If you can create that culture at your table where you're all co-DMs, oh, not in yeah. the same game, but, like, where everyone takes their turn DMing and you don't – you know, every time we have people on the show, they talk about how they're the forever DM. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and we, we have a tendency to kind of almost – uh, pigeonhole Levi into that a lot too. Like he's always running. He's getting more chance now on this stream to play in games than he's he's had in years. Like mm-hmm. so, you know, he's I think he's living that up as much as he can. But um, if you can create that in your table where you guys take turns running campaigns and everyone gets a more fair, balanced stance to be player and DM, like mm-hmm. you, in my opinion, you'll have a healthier table than most tables out there for sure. A more a more well rounded skill set. Everybody understands then what being a DM is like <laughs> and being yes. a player is like. And once you have that across the table, like that is a recipe for a fantastic group that mm-hmm. could probably play for a very long time together. I yeah. just just my personal opinion on that. But yeah, I agree because th- there's a lot of um, a lot of little things that happen at a table like. Uh, you know, chaos around the times where you're trying to get information as a DM, like initiative as an example. Uh, these things could be a lot smoother if everyone involved understood, you know, like how stressful that can be as a DM trying to get this stuff flowing. Yeah. Uh, it's like little things, but like, I think what's really interesting about uh, everyone mixing it around is that every person who steps into the role of storyteller, DM, game master, whatever you want to call it, comes out with a different skill set. And there are different things that they are versed at that others aren't. And just because your particular group had a particular individual step up the first time and set kind of a tone, doesn't mean that's the only way that games can be done in your group. And a lot of times people just don't know what they're missing. So like when you have other people step up and try things and preferably earlier than later, like the earlier you do this in your your table's existence, probably the the easier it's going to be because you're I agree. more tolerant of uh, you know flaws in your system and all that kind of stuff. Well, and, and I think that it's safe to say this, and we've said this before, everybody runs the game they wish they could play in. <laughs> yeah, so but you learn nobody ever that. really gets to play in the game that they run. Like, mm-hmm. if anyone else takes over as the DM seat, like, if you were a DM, there's probably things in that same story, whether it's a modular or homebrew, where you may have done something differently. Mm-hmm. You'd have made a different call here. You would have you would have set up the map differently. You'd have done more terrain, or you'd have done mm-hmm. you know uh, enemies would have been a little more tactical or less tactical based on you know maybe there's there's little things you'll see after you've been DMing for a while. You'll be like oh, that's not how I would have done this, but you know I respect them as a DM that that was their choice and this is the direction they went. Like right, so mm-hmm. you just know that like. I think the other hard part is is giving up that control when you've had it for a while and be going back <laughs> yeah. to being a player and being like, this is their game. This is how they want to do this. I'm on board. 
Mm -hmm. And I think being a DM helps you remember to do that when it's not your turn. But there is that little like buffer period where you have to remember you're not you're not mm -hmm. the DM right now. So yeah, and I think being a DM also makes you a better player in general. Uh, like you're talking yeah. about some of those reasons, but I think in addition, like you learn how to share the the space. You learn how gaming is not about winning because uh, you're used to losing a lot as a DM. Uh, so like it's it's more about the experience. And I think once you have that under your belt. Uh, it translates to your play style. Like as a player, you're you're more concerned about creating an environment where everyone's having a good time. Uh, now, Air Lasers Group, they were saying that every month uh, someone did a one shot so that the DM could pop in, and that's a really good approach. That's good. It gives everyone uh, like a low uh, expectations attempt. You know, they can come in, write something small, have a little bit of experience in the belt, let other people play things, and maybe that gets them over that hump of, uh, you know, wanting to tackle an actual campaign. And uh, it's, so like, it's a good starter. I yeah. still think down the road, if you can get to full fledged campaign rotations, mm -hmm. that's the best. Yeah. But uh, one shots to give a DM a break though, is certainly, um, I mean, that's how I kind of got my start DMing. Like I started mm -hmm. just DMing to, when Levi needed a break. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I try to run something. So, you know, yeah. it's, I think it's definitely, there's a spot for that. One shots are not a bad way to start it. Yeah, but one the, week is often not enough. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> it, it, it gets you somewhere, but you can learn a lot from trying to construct an actual lengthy game. Uh, VTAC yeah. is saying that the pressure uh, they feel at the table is um, that one of their players is a published fantasy author, five books. Wow. So he, they're nervous about writing uh, good stories that compare to a writer. And, and again, that, I mean, that it comes back that. to what we were saying before, right? So like, Again, everyone has a different skill set. And just because you're good at writing a story doesn't mean you're good at running a good game. And there are different facets of game that come into play there. Now, are, is an author probably prone to pay attention to story first? Yes. Uh, are well, they probably aware of things that uh, would be mistakes or whatever in the process? Yes. But let me tell you this, as a massage therapist, uh, being my, my profession, <laughs> I... I'm always hearing people say, I can't give you a massage because you're a professional and I would be embarrassed. And I will tell you, every single massage therapist will say, I don't give a shit. Let me on that table. I will be happy with what you give me. Right. Uh, so I think it's the same thing for DMing. Like people are excited to be players. They want to play in your game. Just just run the game. <laughs> you know. That is not true amongst all professions. No, I don't care not. how many times I stab you with a needle to draw blood. I don't want you putting a needle anywhere near me <laughs> if you don't have to. So. Fair enough. Fair enough. It ain't but, always the same. But um, I will say that, um, well, I guess one of the things I was kind of looking at when you were talking about having an author in your group, mm -hmm. we had that at Horn Huttenberg. A Alexander writes, uh, Alex, who played Asher, he mm -hmm. is a published novelist as well. And a fantastic GM in his own right. Mm -hmm. So, and I was talking last night, had a really good conversation with Debbie Snacks actually last night for quite a while. We were talking about it. And this is something I said to her that I do. And this is a piece of advice I have for anyone who's writing for some, for a group of people who are DMs and eight capable writers in their own right is I don't write endings. Mm. I don't so much write endings. I write conflicts, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you have really good storytellers in your group, let them tell the story, right? Mm -hmm. Let them tell the story and your story will look great because they're good storytellers. So you just have to set the stage in the conflict and then figure yeah, out if that conflict exactly. is a yes, no type answer. What does yes look like? What does no look like? And just be prepared for both. And you do that with enough different outcomes. If you want to get to what a quote unquote outcome might look like, and you let the players run the rest of the story, they're not going to turn around and be like, your story sucked when they're the ones who wrote the story. <laughs> they're not going to turn around and put that on you. They're going to be like, you set up a really, really cool situation, and this is how we dealt with it, and this is the end we've created, and they're mm -hmm. going to be happy with it. Yep. And I think that's a big part of it, is, is recognizing the fact that it's a collaborative experience. As a DM, yes, right. you, have a, you can put your game on rails, and you can script out a really intricate story, but that's probably not a good game. Uh, and more Probably. more than likely, like Dustin's describing, uh, your story is going to go places that the players take it rather than where you take it. So it's a little push and pull. And uh, what you're saying there a second ago that the uh, the author is worried about being a DM because they don't have as much control. Yeah, that's that's a big part of it. Um, that is a that is a skill of its own. 
And uh, we've talked a little bit in the past about how like telling stories in different different media are very different. You know, so like yep. telling in a video game as compared to a tabletop role playing game as compared to a book or a TV show or whatever. Um, they're very, very different in what the goals are and the requirements of success are different. So, you know, everyone's going to be a nervous DM their first time. That's well, that's just how it is. I see Game Master's Vault chimed in here, said gray areas are the best for storytelling, in his honest mm -hmm. opinion, uh, especially moral choices. And mm -hmm. I 110% agree. And, right. mm -hmm. and every time I write a conflict, because again, I don't, I don't feel like I so much write the end of the story. I write a conflict, I write a start point, and then a lot of game sessions of guiding them towards that conflict until I see what they do when they hit to that conflict is kind of how I deal with it. So what I do is I take the most simple baseline mission quest idea mm -hmm. and I say, okay, there's obviously the good answer and the bad answer to this. So right. let's just say it's assassination plot. Kill this person. That's easy. Okay. Got a big bad end guy. We're going to kill him. All right. Well, Killing him is not a problem because he's bad. Mm -hmm. So what happens if, uh, is there a good reason not to kill the big bad guy? Can I make that a possibility? Can I, can I start layering other reasons on here? Why maybe it's, maybe they got to keep him around. What, mm -hmm. maybe there's a worse fate if they do get rid of him. Right. And like, it, it's not until you start layering on those other things that you can take what's a very simple, mundane, done all the time story plot element and turn it into a gray moral choice for a group to have to deal with. And that's and that's what I strive for, and then I don't care if they do it or not. Right. That's the key. You can't care if mm -hmm. they do it or not. You have to prepare for both exits out of the conflict. Yeah, you you got to create a world and where right. people are living in a situation that's dynamic, right? So, like you're saying, you set up these situations where you get the types of stories that you're looking for based on. Uh, maybe the nuances of what that conflict are. So like, what does the conflict tell you in, in terms of uh, tone and style, right? Like, is there an issue of purely morals, you know, determining if somebody is, what, at what point will somebody do a bad thing? Uh, is it a question of, you know, politics, you know, or something, right? You know, is there some piece of mystery there that is causing the conflict? And oh, there's, game there's a lot there's of things. Vault. Oh, come to find out the big bad guy's a little cripple girl. You just go watch Terror and Tree, though. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I did that. That was me. You <laughs> nailed it. <laughs> There's a fair amount of that. Uh, Air Laser's got another question for us here. So uh, how do you deal with the pre-game jitters, anxiety, when prepping and performing a game? Uh, honestly, that's that's a tough question. It's going to be individual, I think, for everyone. Uh, Dustin's going to hold up his rum. Yep, there it is. Right on cue. Right there. Um, That's the secret to my success right there. <laughs> you know, it, I'm a firm believer that you have to take the test in the same mind frame that you studied for it. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So if I'm doing myself a few shots of rum while I'm writing these stories, which I typically am, mm -hmm. uh, I probably have a few right before I run game mm -hmm. just to keep me in that same that same mindset. So right. for me, it's a good healthy dose of rum. Yeah, for me... Um... The things that make me nervous are what I don't know, right? Uh, and so if I have stuff to prep, you know, just being good at doing my prep ahead of time. Uh, so that's that's the first step. Uh, generally, as you get more and more experienced, you realize you don't need as detailed a prep and you become better and better improving. And I think once you get that under your belt, the jitters start to go away a little bit, but not completely. And then if I have all my prep ready, and I'm, I know that I'm decent at improving, and I still feel it. I usually do something physical, you know, like I'll do like push-ups or something, just to get that like nervous energy out. And then it's just starting. Like once you start, it's you're you're there. You don't have a choice anymore. And now you can't be nervous because it's ongoing. <laughs> when I I do my prep, usually sitting here at the computer because it's all on roll twenty. I've got overlays. I got to set up. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I get all that stuff done here and you guys can watch me do my prep on Wednesday nights around here. So at least for right now. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, you, those of you who've tuned into under the influence um, have seen me do my prep. So you got a little idea of how I do it. But a lot of my writing doesn't happen here on prep. A lot of my writing takes place when I go out on my walks and stuff in the morning. So right. a lot of times I'm rolling around those ideas. And I know we talked about it with Horn Huttenberg. Like I'd be out on my three mile walk and then it would hit me. I'd be like, yes, this is what has to happen next to, to bridge them from where they are to the, 
to the um to the conflict again the conflict i have in mind or the, the moral choice that i want to push to i'm like how do i get them how do i push them to that limit and usually it comes out while i'm walking or doing something physical so sometimes that can definitely be a yeah vtech you were there for the 100 ghouls we created right. so you know we're going to do more of that this coming wednesday so only won't be ghouls it'll be something else this time <laughs> good uh, question coming in yeah, we got a couple of them. Uh, so early is just making it rain with the, the questions. Uh, so how does DM prep differ from in real life and online using Roll20? Um, I did a little bit of it. Uh, I used a module that already had most of the Roll20 stuff prepackaged, and that was by design. Because when I, I started looking at the, um, you know, the Roll20 interface, I wasn't very accustomed to it. And there's a lot to, uh, of a learning curve there of setting things up. Uh, so what I noticed comparatively between the online model and tabletop model is you know on the tabletop i can grab a marker and draw a map really quick on a you know on our mm -hmm. random spot and you guys know what it looks like we can role play and we're good improv is very easy there whereas with roll 20 making a map is not that easy and you know you're gonna have somebody watching you make the sausage so to speak live while you're doing it on roll 20. so right. For I would say for the roll twenty, you uh, you over prep, <laughs> or or you just get screwed. <laughs> well, I'll tell you how I handled that, Jeff. Mm -hmm. I made nondescript maps. Mm. Yeah. Uh, did my auto cut out? Okay, no, so good. Um, so what I did was I had specific battle maps. Mm -hmm. uh, the warehouse fifty one. Uh, if a Terran tree fell, there's a church scene that's a battle. I have those maps figured out and those are maps that when they get to those scenes, I can flip over to those maps and those maps are ready to go. Any other impromptu hard to map out thing on roll 20 because the dimensions are simply too big. Like mm -hmm. I can't do vampire maps. It's just not going to happen. No. Yeah. You're not going to see a map in, Van in I kindred because vampires can move so ridiculously far that a map is completely pointless. Mm -hmm. So what I did was, is if you've watched my Zweihander games, I created battle mats that I put the tokens on that just have range increments and that just have some light rules on it to help speed along game. And they, they work as an abstract map that allows combat to flow because mm -hmm. you're doing it mostly theater of the mind. Yeah. And, so, and so because of that, you don't need a ton of map, but if you have a few of these things that you can utilize you can you can use them to bridge not needing 500 maps and keep the maps that you are going to make detailed make them good mm -hmm. and you know keep those in your back pocket till till they come up in your game um so that's i guess that's my advice and that's what i did yeah i, I think it's a pretty good approach to it uh yeah and, and it's i think really uh, we maybe over rely on maps a little bit in our group uh just because we kind of got away from the, the mind's eye stuff and went purely to the grid base and i'm guessing you know like like you said if we have a situation where there's a very important place where knowing exactly how things are related to one another is important you know that kind of thing you need a map and like you said it needs yeah. to be intricate especially if you have a zone that you're going to be repeatedly returning to i think that tells so, you prep that map it, um, yeah I, I, for me the decision to make an actual map or not mm -hmm. is Am I doing anything interesting with the surroundings? Mm -hmm. If it's just these are the mobs, these are the players, I don't need a map. Right. If it's if it's the mobs plus players plus interesting surroundings, interesting uh, you know, terrain, interesting uh features, you know, a layer, if there's something else that makes this place cooler than just these are the mobs that are in it then i make especially in roll 20 and i guess if there's a real good answer to air laser's question is i realize i have a viewing audience that needs to see it so mm -hmm. then the question becomes what do they need to see can they follow along as viewers who maybe hop in in the middle of a combat and immediately know what's going on a map is hugely helpful for that Very, for, yeah. for a viewer so for me i was going to run a lot of uh mind's eye was why hander but I knew I needed something that would help them immediately engage and realize what's going on. So that's why I created my Roll20 mats. Yeah, and and I, I think some of it's going to be that you have to, to look at your particular situation. So like if you're streaming, I think that visuals are very important. If yes. you're sitting around as a group of players that are not on a stream, then it comes down to what your table 
is like if, if you have a lot of people who are visually minded like they they look at things they understand it better that way maybe you need the map and making it a little bit more detailed um, <laughs> if that's your skill set you know like if you're an artist or something like that making maps maybe that's creative and fun for you like that's the thing that you're going to really dig into uh so definitely dive into it uh i found I, for myself i i tended to shy away from the map making just because the process itself was a pain and i wasn't yeah. very good at it uh, whereas i never felt like i had that much of an issue uh using like a tabletop methodology i feel like i make pretty good maps on roll 20 yeah yeah because because so. i mean i know and for those of you who watch my gm prep when i make a map i'm using the free assets like there's no paid assets. I don't buy anything extra. Everything I do, I just pull for the free assets and then just keep layering on top of doing other things that you can find for free on there that until I got a map that looks like I want it to. So you can watch me make those maps again on GM prep when I need one. But um, and there might be one I'm working on this week too, or at least a couple of a uh, couple weeks maybe I'll be working on. But uh, I think that it is important to have a map. And, th and the other time where a map or visual aid comes in really handy is if you do have a group that's doing a lot of those side scenes. Well, thank you, Dragons of the Dungeon yeah, with thank a you. rate of 25. Welcome Raiders. Um, so I think if you're, if you have a lot of people who are busy doing side scenes and then they come back to the table on their turn, or if they're talking, you know, sidebar real life conversations, a map is super helpful because then you don't have to explain the last three turns to them <laughs> while they were busy getting more pizza. What yep. exactly happened? They can look at the map and go, Oh, that doesn't look good. Oh, is that a fireball? Oh man. All right. Yeah. You know, we're it, so those things help a lot in those kind of situations. Um, yeah. Sure do. Uh, so for those of you guys who just rated in, welcome. Uh, we are cool. doing a bit of troubleshooting for your tabletop experiences. So if you've got stuff that you are trying to resolve, whether it's uh, you know issues around the table with player problem players if it's trying to come up with a new backstory if it's uh trying to come up with a voice for a character whatever if you got something in your mind that you want kind of to ask we'll try to troubleshoot shoot it and uh give you some some of our two cents so that's what we're doing tonight uh air laser wanted us to double check the second question before we get into this one. how do you balance the fight i think is the next one she's yeah. wants to do that's and a good one. that is very system dependent Mm -hmm. That is a very system dependent question, but I will tell you a model that I have used for D and D for Pathfinder and for Zweihander that has always worked for me. I call it the plus one model. Okay. I don't use monsters from the monsters manual and challenge ratings are just a suggestion. Mm -hmm. I make characters as my bad guys. And I make exactly the same number of characters as I have players, plus one. <laughs> and that oh, is usually enough of a challenge that it, it usually makes a fight very challenging. Now, where I would advise not using that is if you're someone who likes to set up two or three encounters a session. Yeah, that is definitely don't in that case. But for my Way group, hard. where typically one combat is about all we get through a night. Mm -hmm. a, a pound for pound, level for level, character versus character is a good fight. So plus one to make it really hard and then just know that you're going to withdraw. You're going to, you're going to let your characters make some mistakes. The NPCs are not a well, well machine all the time. Like usually pushes them to their limit. And then they're usually don't want anything else to do a combat for a while after that. And I think Horn Huntberg was a good example. Sure. Yeah. And I think that works really well in a, um, and, and more of like a, a human, human kind of interaction, you know, not as right. humans, but like, you know, if, not monster right. to human kind of situation. So if you have like a political game, you have a social game, I think that works uh, really well. If you're running more of a dungeon crawl though, and you're dealing with uh, you know, monsters and traps and that kind of thing, yes, there are uh, the CR ratings um, and that sort of thing. We typically don't use them uh, very much, but it all comes down to what your goals are, right? So like, if you have a goal of just scaring the bejesus out of your players, then that's going to look different than a trivial experience that's just supposed to be a hiccup that comes along the road. Uh, so you kind of initially just have to figure out what you're trying to get out of that that particular scene. Uh, then obviously you're looking at like descriptively like what makes sense for your story. Obviously you need that. Uh, but then in terms of like the actual difficulty of a fight, um, there's a lot of ways of achieving difficulty without making it necessarily deadly, right? 
Like you don't necessarily have to have a bad guy that has 10,000 health to be scary, right? Uh, right. It's a lot of it's about how you describe it. I, I find like if, if the same amount of damage is coming my way, but it's described in a way that's unsettling, that's going to have a, a better impact to me than a fight that drags on for multiple hours. You know, I, I think, I think there's some truth to that, but I think that's very player dependent. Can be. You can, yeah. de you can describe blood and gore to me all day. I work in the healthcare field. You're not going to face me. It will not unsettle me because I see the shit in real life. So I'm so immune to that that you you can describe it as horribly as you want to, and I'm just going to be like, "That's cool," and move on with my day. So like, it, it's not a bad suggestion if you know your players well enough. You know that'll that'll land for them. Like mm -hmm. I know I can do that to Jeff, and it will land for him. Sure. I can talk about how the feelings that a NPC or a character has, and I know that Jeff will latch on to those things. Other players won't. Sure. So you just have to know your audience a bit. I would say that. A lot of times we talked with Travis Lake a couple weeks ago about this. Like if you want to make certain things kind of scary or whatever, don't attack hit points. That's the, that's the character strength. Attack other things, um, you know, use other systems. Um, if you want to make those things challenging, um, you know, use, use the things that player characters are not typically built towards. And it's a little more, you're usually able to get a little more of that oomph in there than just going rock'em sock'em robots. And then yeah. adding on layer description because they know they're not going to die yet. They can see the hit points on their character sheet. You can only make two hit points as nasty sounding as two hit points can be because they know they got 98 more. So you're yeah, not, not going to phase it, most people. A lot of it comes down to, though, like what the dynamics of the scene look like. Like if suddenly you're doing something and the environment changes in a way that puts a time limiter on it. Oh, okay, now we need to worry. Um, right. You know, right. somebody is being dragged away down a hallway. Oh shit, things just got real. You know, like it could be just a cobalt dragging your friend away. But like, you know, in that situation suddenly it's it's a whole different kettle of fish than uh fighting three cobalts in the hall, right? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, you have to quickly decide, you know, am I going to blow through these two guys and then chase? Am I going to just break loose and hope these guys don't catch me? Right. There's a lot of things that come up that can change the flow. Now, what uh what was being said here earlier with uh, Game Master's Vault. Uh, yeah, the the, the uh, challenge rating calculators are always weird to me because in our experience, they're always super weak unless they aren't. And then when they're not, they're just complete overkill. And there's, it, it, it seems to be a break. Party composition makes a big difference on challenge rating, and that's why I don't like that number. Mm -hmm. If, you know, challenge ratings are cool until you, like, have groups that are built on crit and you decide to use undead. Mm -hmm. If the whole group's built around critting, like they're if they're that hardcore into that, you throw that cha that challenge group rating worth of undead in there that can't be crit or constructs. You know, now all of a sudden, it's, you're way overpowered. Whereas if that's a group of paladins and clerics, and you throw that same challenge grading group in there, like that same challenge, they they're just gonna steamroll it because they're built for that. So for me, like I I like challenge rating. I hate it at the same time. Like mm -hmm. I really don't like challenge rating. But that's it, it, it's what you're doing. If you're doing D and D, you're gonna have that as the as a starting point, and then you just have to understand when you have to crank it up and down a little bit. And that's takes practice, probably. Yeah, CR is like horseshoes. You're, you're not yeah. gonna get the ringer every time. You're probably gonna right. land in some vicinity. And you need to move it around, figure out where you need to be. And uh, I, I think that's really the answer of it. It's it's really. Uh, what we typically run into is you, you dial a fight up to what level of intensity you want. And then if you overdid it, you pull your punches <laughs> and that's, and then you figure out where that line is and then you're good to go. And Dustin hates that stuff, but I that, don't pull punches. I kill characters and I try to be nicer to the next one. <laughs> yeah. But so like, if I, if I put a character out there like level one party and I was like, you know what? I think a, a good challenge would be a great worm dragon. And then a great worm pops out and murders him. That's probably not ideal, right? So I'm going to probably come up with circumstances that allow you to get away or, you know, deal with consequences, but not so severe. Uh, but, you know, we've had this argument about whether it's yeah. okay to fudge dice at any point in game. And Dustin's firmly on the it's never okay. If you're going to roll a dice, don't fudge but it. I and, put uh, mine right there on the stream with mm -hmm. everyone else's. I can't fudge them. You as the viewers watched it happen. <laughs> they are what they are. Yeah, but I don't know. I, I think there there are times I've put together encounters and... In my head, I thought, okay, this is going to be a moderate challenge. It'll put them through their paces, but, you know, it shouldn't be that big of a deal. Uh, whereas 
the actual gameplay experience turn into just like a domino effect of just like catastrophes and they're going down quick um you know in those certain circumstances i look at why it's happening and i go is that what i want out of this scene the answer is no and i i modify it i mean i made it up in the first place so i can make it up now uh and i don't know for me i think that's a better way of doing it than just like underpowering a fight or um i don't know just overdoing it really um I know we had a question come in from Dragons in the Dying Room about handling God arcs. God and then arcs, maybe okay. we'll go through the list to make sure we got Air Laser's third question because I'm not positive I remember what order they were all in now. Uh, the next but, one um, she had was NPCs. How you prepare okay. Um, I, I'll give you my little quick rundown on, on gods. Um, I don't like them to be <laughs> directly involved in my story. Yeah. I like for them to be there. I like for their religion to be there. I like for them to be a presence in the world as far as people talk, believe, and it shapes what the world looks like. Yeah. I do not like to actually confront and deal with them in game. Yeah. In any I way agree. that's mechanical. I like for them to be mysterious and ominous, and I prefer a more Greek style pantheon where they're very flawed individuals to begin with. And so their religions are thus very flawed and I like to leave them there. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like gods to be forces of nature. Like they are so yeah. powerful. There is no way you should be interacting with them directly. Uh, like I like the idea of maybe dealing with their emissaries, that kind of thing. And those figures being like the God characters that normally gets thrown around like the avatar kind of idea. Um, and I think that like separation gives them you know, some kind of special status. It makes them feel bigger. Because as soon as you put a god character on the battle map and put character sheet to it and hit points, he's not a god anymore to me. He's just a bag of hit points, right? Like, he's very powerful potentially, but it's not a god in my mind. And right. so, like, I, I think it's important not to run those directly. Now, if you're talking about just, like, the you know, dealing with, like, a change of the pantheon uh, and, like, the the ramifications of like the church underneath different gods going to war, that kind of stuff. I think that's fucking cool. You can do those sorts of things, but the focus needs to be at the level of the player, right? It needs to be right. zoomed in on why the, the players are relevant. Uh, and so right. like whatever the fallout of that experience needs to come down to what's happening at the player level and what's happening at the God level really doesn't matter. You know, like it's happening, but it doesn't have a direct relevance to the PCs. Unless it does. And you have to kind of work from that angle. To me, I think of it the same way. Like I said, I think of it like the Greek stories of the heroes, right? Like mm -hmm. typically when the gods are players, they do something for the first 10 minutes of a story. They make a crucial godlike issue with each other. And then the rest of the story is the humans dealing with the outcome of those gods doing one thing. Like... Now it's the hero Perseus who has to deal with all this crap or Hercules now has to go through these trials because Zeus decided he got mad at whoever. And, you know, they they have some they have some tiff with each other. So they summon a hero to go do something just to prove that their hero can or something like. And that's and then the god steps back and just lets the hero do his thing, like because that's who your player characters are, the heroes at that point. So, you know, you're and then the whole rest of the story, you don't see him again until the very end. And they show back up. Now, Dungeon Dragons is dying. said he's talking about a character becoming a god. That's really, really cool. Walking off into the sunset area right there, my friend. Like, yeah. If you're not doing that at level twenty plus, like, if you're if you're hitting god of ten, like, I don't, I, I guess I don't know what your pantheon really looks like, but mm -hmm. um, I don't, I don't deal with that. St I mean, Bowron's kind of doing that, mm. but you know, he's like Levi has decided to start creating a religion around my druid. And I, I have nothing to do with it. So yeah, that's just me, I guess. But let's see. Yeah, I, I think that arc is kind of challenging. Like I think the actual playing through the process is something you could do. I think the actual the player being a god in game doesn't work. Like I think you really unless the whole story is about like the consequences of unlimited power, right? You know, that could be interesting, but it has to be handled very carefully. Like, I would, I would say that, like, attaining something like, you know, like, uh, the process of, like, lichhood or something like that, that process could be an interesting quest. Um, yeah. 
but it has to be more than just one player's game, right? So uh, yeah. unless the whole story is about the party somehow being involved in this situation, I probably wouldn't do it, but I don't know. Different yeah. games, you know. Uh, I see one for you can check back there. What was uh, how creating an NPC? Was that Air Laser's next question? I got one from Debbie Snacks there that we want to. Yeah, how do you prepare? That I want to feel, okay, but I want to make sure we get Air Laser's other question first. Yep. Uh, so she want to know how we prepare NPCs. Uh, so I guess the question is: Are you talking about from a story perspective, or are you talking about from a mechanics story? Uh, on Wednesday when I make NPCs. <laughs> that's true too. Um, I, I think they're very difficult things. If you're talking about mechanics. Um, the same rules that apply to making a character generally apply to NPCs. Uh, they're a little bit more stripped back just because you don't spend a crazy amount of time with NPCs running the scene uh, or being the main prime movers and shakers of a scene in terms of throwing dice. Uh, so I would focus more on the persona and the motivations than anything else. Motivations probably yeah. most of all. Uh, like if you understand the psychology of an NPC, like why they would do certain things, what's important to them, uh, what's the things that get under the skin, that kind of stuff. The rest of everything about that NPC will write itself, like in the moment. I'm a I'm a firm believer, and this is if you were on my uh, last GM prep where I did a hundred ghouls with the help mm -hmm. of chat, you saw exactly how I make NPCs. Mm -hmm. Now those were run of the mill NPCs that were just regular old people. And so what I did was, is I gave them regular old stats and I said, every person's going to have one attribute that's slightly higher than all the others. There'll be one thing everyone's good at. Everyone's good at one thing. I don't mm -hmm. care who you are out in the world. You have one stat that's a little higher than the others. That's, we're going to we're going to decide what that one thing is they're good at. And everyone has one skill that's usable, one usable skill that's higher than the others. So that's all I did is just decide those two things. And then a little line out at the end that just says, player quirk, like personality quirk, something, anything else we want to put on there that might be interesting about this character, a little fluff. And then when that character gets brought in, that's all they'll have. And if the players gravitate towards it and it needs more fleshed out, then I will hone in and flesh it out more later. But just to get started with, unless it's a big bad in guy or a heavy, heavy plot NPC to begin with, exactly. like I'm yeah. not full sheeting it out. Now this week, we're not making ghouls this week on GM prep. We're going to be making the sires for my player characters who've given me enough to work with that I can make sires, you're going to see full fledged vampire sheets getting created mm -hmm. because those have to be right. Those I can't just walk in with two words and a couple dots on sheet. Like I got to know what those guys can do. Mm -hmm. So that's going to yeah. be, that's going to be different. So, and, and that's really, again, you got to identify what you're doing with the NPC is the NPC just a person that exists in the world that may come in contact with. Or are right. they, like Dustin said, a, a story NPC? Do they have a role to play? Is there something you need them to do? Uh, if that's the case, then that's where you focus. You focus on their quirks, their their motivations, and what they're there to facilitate within your story. And then in so terms of stats, like one approach you can do is you go to the back of the book and you find generic stat line for security guard. And you say, that seems good enough. And then you maybe tweak a skill or two to make it fit your character and you're done. Unless you want to go full out and then you can make a full on character sheet. And then it's just like you've, you've done as a player, you know, you just make your character sheet and have fun doing it and uh, hope it works out. Um, you know, for, I run a lot as Y hander and <laughs> uh, main gauche has an entire section on making NPCs. So it's a very stripped down versus a regular full character sheet. Um, so for a lot of the things like when I ran cultist or when I ran the bandits, they were very stripped down character sheets. They were not a full fledged sheet, mm -hmm. but for the purposes of roll 20 and for the attacks and everything to show up inside the, the frames and for the damages and stuff to be there, I had to build the sheets more fully than what they were in the books. So when I pulled like cultist out of the book, I had to like reverse engineer it a little bit to like make it fit in there just right. And then add the stats in so that it would all function correctly and show up in the display. So I actually did more work on Zwei Hander than what the book actually tells me to. So, but if anytime I'm uh, creating NPCs and you'll see this again, Wednesday, when I make vampires, they will be full sheets mm -hmm. as close to full sheets as I can get them. If they're going to be on screen enough to warrant it. If it's yep. a ghoul that they may have one interaction with, it's going to be very vague 
vague baseline. If I have to make a roll, I know how many dice without putting too much thought into it kind of roll. And then if they need a full sheet because it's a NPC that like Jusica might have been if she had survived last don't sleep, like may have become more of a full sheet by next game if if she had survived. So yep. and yeah, what those game, things happen. Game Master's Vault's talking a little bit here. Um, they're, they're saying that they write up literally every NPC and everything that's going on. Um, that would probably not be my approach, but if it works for you, awesome. Because you're saying it's easier for you to improv by knowing everything about the NPCs ahead of time. Uh, for me, like we've talked about this in the past, like I think the approach that I prefer as a, uh, a creative person would be to do the minimum amount necessary to convey the idea that the world is fleshed out and that there's more there. And then if the players hit those places, then detail those out and, and flesh them out. You know, I, and I think, I, that think works you have, I think you have to know your players a little bit. Yeah. I think players, there's some players out there. And if you have these kind of players in your group game masters vault, this may be why you picked up this habit. Mm -hmm. It's like watching, it's like watching the matrix. Okay. Players enter this, this world. And the first thing they sometimes do is try to find the edge of reality. <laughs> yeah, they, they Truman show the shit out of this thing, right? Like, if they can get a sense that that the next NPC in the next store over isn't prepped, they'll go to that one specifically just to see you improv. Yeah. So if that's your player type, if they're kind of instigators in that way, you may have developed the habit of making sure that every shop owner in this town has already statted and figured out, just so that your world seems like it's complete to the player, because they are looking for flaws in your game system and your game world. If you got players that are just going with the flow, like you don't have to do all that extra work. Like yeah. you just and, have to know your players. And I would say, okay, to the next part of that question, um, I, I would say do yourself a favor in your DM prep or whatever. Make a list of names and just descriptors. Just like Dustin's kind of doing with his uh ghoul yep. idea. But the ghoul, yeah. So you could just randomly be like, uh, oh, you ran into Jake Halpert. Uh, he's uh, about four foot tall. He's super short, and he's got, like, uh, green hair. Okay, cool. I can run with that. And then if you do a voice, uh, write yourself some kind of notes. You're like, oh, I used gruff plus Scottish or something. You know, and then if it's something that you'll remember, you can come back to it the next time and, and make it better. Uh, really, it's just... I'm improv on the fly you just do something and then you just work with what you did <laughs> I, I i take i do the same thing mouse conspiracy i'll write down like name accent job i'm terrible with my consistency on my accents i'll forget yeah, it's hard i'll forget like i all my major npcs in huttenberg i all had specific voices and accents and everything figured out for and like sometimes i'd catch myself forgetting to do them like but it happened but you know what like no one ever really like said too much about it they just went with it like yeah. most players will do that at the end of the day they'll just go right along and there is nothing better than random name generators out there on the internet. Like if you're running a game over roll 20 and someone's like, who's the shopkeeper next door? Just click. Sometimes you get really weird names, but who cares? Go with it. Weird. Like yeah. it, the weirder it is, the more they'll think you actually made it up. <laughs> yeah. So it's, you'll learn really quick as a, as a new DM that players will go to what they're interested in. They'll pay attention to NPCs. You never expect them to interact with. They will fall in love with somebody you gave like two words of a descriptor to. They will completely ignore the person you've got 10 pages of story on. It, it just, it's just the way of things. It's the nature of running games. Like you will never, ever get it right <laughs> on which NPCs are going to like. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, always, it's, I don't, I don't ever get hung up on it one way or the other. I'm always just surprised by which ones they gravitate to. Mm -hmm. Like that's really what it boils down to is it's, it's never a matter of like, I'm disappointed that they didn't like an NPC or it's weird that they did like this one. It's just one of those things where I'm always just like of all the NPCs, that's the one they picked mm -hmm. that they, that they, that they just want to make sure they keep around. So, you know, that's a, that's just. All right. We got a lot of questions backlog, so let's go ahead and dig yeah, through them real quick. Um, it. I want to come back to Air Laser's uh, question about uh, if it's too early to fight a dragon or whatever. Uh, we'll come back to that one just so we get somebody else's question in here real quick. Um, if you guys can, make sure you're redeeming your wisdom check questions because it puts them on a specific list that we go through. So, like, I'm going back to find Debbie's question, but I don't think she redeemed it. So, I'm. Yeah, I don't see one in there. So uh, I'm, I'm going to make sure I know what Air Laser's talking about. The next on Air Laser question came from Father Jarity. Uh, Maybe more of a statement. We'll see. 
Uh, reality can no longer perceive me, and I find myself being watched by anyone who can't perceive reality. Good time for Pi? Always good time for Pi. <laughs> um, oh, I saw her quick. I found it. Okay. Well, what was the Go question ahead. from Debbie? Uh, she was saying that her druid was, um, her DM was wanting her to worship a specific moon goddess because she was Circle of the Moon as a druid. Mm, okay. uh, you know, I'll, I'll just throw this out there as a fellow druid player. I like the idea of druids being polytheist. Mm. I think what separates them from a cleric is that they're polytheist. Um, Saloon is not, well, I don't know which is, I don't know much about that specific thing, but the circle of the moon is a specific circle for druid and their shape changers and beast changers because of it. So if you have a specific God that fits that you can do it to me, then I would always ask the question. And this is, this is to me, and I think that Travis Leggy went in with Scarred Lands is fantastic because it sets the stage for the difference between a cleric and a druid is. But for me, anytime I go to play a druid, which I'm doing now, I have to ask myself, how is this character going to function religiously different than if I was a cleric of that one god? Hmm. If there are clerics of that god that exist, how is my druid then functionally different? And the answer for me when I started playing Balron was he's, he, he worships an ocean god primarily. But as you've come to find, like he considers all of the old gods to be the ones that he hit true gods that he actually worships. He worships all of them. He just leans more towards Elos than the others. But Oros has been there, you know, the ones that he considers the true gods. And I kind of had to hone that out myself. Levi didn't exactly give me that. I just kind of figured that out on my own plane of druid. If you want to nail yourself down to just one deity as a druid, I, you probably can. But um, to me, then that puts you too much in the realm of cleric of that god versus druid. So yeah. you gotta you gotta work on how to separate those two in my head. So that, yeah, there's a couple the, things that come into play here. Um, one would be maybe there is a story reason that the the DM wants you to pick the religion, uh, and if that's the case, then you just go with it because it ties you into the story a little easier. Uh, but you know, like what Dustin's saying with kind of separating out things, I think another way you could approach that besides just being polytheist, which works, uh, which I think most characters should be anyway. Uh, I agree with you there too. <laughs> but I think one thing you could do that would separate you is come up with tenets, things that are like philosophies underneath that that you believe in, and then focus more on that than the you know clerical style religious rituals and that kind of thing. Um, and I and I think that yeah. gives you a, kind of a different take. Uh, and in, in general, I think if you're going to go with any kind of religious character, I, I I like those ideas better than just like. You believe in justice. Okay, well, what does that mean? Like, what does yeah. believing in justice mean to your character? Like, I, how do they go about doing that? I think people had a tendency to always steer clear of it because it got too into the realm of paladin. Well, Paladins always have those list of tenets. So if you were a cleric with the same list of tenets, it's like, well, then what's the difference between a cleric and a paladin? Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. other than the obvious stat adjustments, one's clearly more fighter and the other's clearly more caster right. on a mechanical level. But if you were in the world, how would you distinguish one can carry a sword, one has to use a mace. Like, is that really all you can do to do? if two were standing side by side, both in plate mill, because they can both wear it, both wearing the same sash to the same god? You're like, well, you're clearly the paladin because you got a sword. Like, is that really all you got? Like, so for me, like, I think that's where people would steer clear sometime of creating those intricate tenets, like for their religions, is because they felt a little too paladin at that point. And I can understand that. Yeah. So again, for me, that's where I look at something like Druid as a, as a far more footloose and fancy free religious caster who is not as uh, tied down to any one, one deity, but is dealing with all the different forces of nature. Cause that's what your spell selection is going to reflect. You can, you can cast fire and water and air and earth spells. And a lot of those things usually in most pantheons are divvied up amongst different gods. So why, why nail yourself down to just one? Yeah, and I think there's another way of kind of looking at it, too. Like, when I think of a god, I think of, of something that is based off of uh, culture, right? It, it is a reflection in some way, or it's the origin, I guess, and, and another view of it, of that culture's beliefs and thinking and style and all that kind of stuff. Whereas when I think of a druid, I think of primal elemental. Like, I don't think of there being right. a god of fire that you are worshipping. I take it as you are 
you're participating in, you're, you're experiencing, you're re- living with the, the force of fire, you know, and I, I sure. the effects of it. Sure. And so like, I think the emphasis on like where your mindset is, is important. I, think I just different. think that, I just think that when you're talking about, when you're talking about D's, like you can go with it as just as a force if you want to. And that mm-hmm. works, that works well. There's nothing wrong with that because you summon conjure elementals. You can, those things are very much tied into the things that a Druid will get to use when you're a Druid. Mm-hmm. You know, beast, you know, changing forms, things like that can all be tied into those things. And again, this is where, is that how you separate yourself from the clerics? So you can, you can summon earth elementals. But that clerics over there, the only ones summoning Earth elementals are the one who worships the god of Vulcan, ground building dirt, you know, whatever. Who who is the who is the guy whose uh, you know backs you walk upon, if you will. Like those clerics can do the same thing as you because they worship a specific god. You just worship the elemental force, and you can make that work if you want to. There's a lot of different ways to go about that. So yeah, a lot of ways to skin a cat. Um... All right, let's jump around some more of these questions. We got one from VTAC there. We also got one that we didn't answer from Air Laser World, two of them it looks like. Um, uh, so she was asking earlier about like, when is it too early to fight a dragon? Um, well, there's a lot of different age categories of dragons. Uh, and actually right. what's interesting, I'm trying to remember if it was fifth edition or if it was Pathfinder. One of the two of them, the first adventure that you had in the back of the book was a white dragon it, at the end. It and, was a baby white dragon. Yeah. Yeah, that thing was a pain in the ass. And that was fourth edition, my friend. That yeah, was, was when I played edition. my Warlord. Right. It was fourth edition and that yeah. thing sucked ass. Yeah, you put the <laughs> put the hurt on it. Um so like you can you can use different age category of dragon. Uh like I think most players when they think of a dragon, they think of like an adult or a great worm and that it's like in their head it's an in game thing. It doesn't have to be. There's a lot of different elements you can play with there and they have different challenge readings kind of give you again a ballpark of where they might fit um i wouldn't say there's a time where you can't use a dragon it just maybe uh since you're saying fight a dragon specifically maybe the answer is that maybe there is a time where that's too early but in terms of like a story element i don't think it was too early for a dragon are you um are they going out as a group of five alone into a lair to slay it uh is the dragon awake is it, are you, are your are your people in the middle of a vast army that's fighting the dragon and they're just manning siege equipment? You can do that at any level, right? It's how are you fighting it. You know, if you're going to go with a big one and you want it to be a big bad end guy, but you want it to show up early, have them have a, have them be part of a whole city defense against one. Mm-hmm. You know, you're you're probably not round by round dictating, but give them some give them some roles for some siege equipment or using some skills they don't normally use to like help combat this dragon away and then go kill it when they're level 20 later down the road. Like, yep. Yep. yeah. So that's, that's probably how I would approach that too. Yeah. Uh, Air Laser's next question to get kind of caught up here. Uh, how do you add balanced and creative items into a game that aren't only a plus one item? So we kind of talked about this on an earlier episode. Um, there's, there, there's a mathematical magical items that are just boring, you know, stat adjustments uh and then there's ones that are tied to story and have new capabilities that are clever uh now where, where those kind of go awry is balancing right so like do you want an item that fits a certain power level okay now you've got a pretty difficult task on your hands that will tend to like hedge you in on how creative you can be now on the other hand are you just trying to come up with something clever and neat that has uh, different uses. Like uh, I think one of the examples uh, that she used before was her DM made a, I'm trying to remember exactly how it worked. It was like a riddle box. And if you, t- if you went up to a bad guy and you asked a riddle, like they were charmed until they could solve it. So like yeah. until the player or the DM could do it, they were charmed or whatever. So like those sorts of things I think are pretty cool. I think, uh, or like they had another one that was like, if they change the letter in the in the word of the spell, like to make a different spell effect, so like if you wrote down like fireball and then you change like two letters in it, can you make a different spell? And so like right. that was kind of neat stuff. Um, I think that's challenging to do if you're concerned about balance. But I I, I would say first and foremost that um, not all classes play the same. That's true. Yeah. So the system dependent. 
um, if you're in Pathfinder one, you can you can bulk all you want to at plus one, plus two, plus three items, but at some point your fighter classes need them. Yep. So um, you can you can you can talk all day about other cool stuff the plus one sword can also do, but it's probably also got to have the plus one on it because otherwise they're not going to keep up with their ability to hit armor classes as you move up the the challenge rating scales. Mm-hmm. So. Um, unless you're just completely custom every mob to make sure that your fighter can still hit it reasonably, which is another way to do it. But um, I'm a big fan of both things with a with a stat bonus that also do something cool. Yeah, a wizard you can give him a plus five staff. He probably cares less. Mm-hmm. Like he's probably never going to actually strike anything with it. So he's more likely going to want the rental box that does something cool because it augments the fact that he's already going to cast most of his spells. He's probably not caring about. You know, he's already not wearing armor, so I mean, you know, it's it. The character classes play differently, so absolutely. And I think really, if you're looking to make a item interesting story wise, you write up an interesting story. Like if you have right. like, a, I don't know, like let's say you have like the Sword of Aragorn, right? Like it doesn't even have to be a bonus magic item. It could just be literally a masterwork sword, but like knowing the history of that makes that item special. Like it has a history to it. It has a connection to this character. You know what it did. So now you're carrying it and you have to carry that forward, that kind of stuff. Um, you know, if you have uh, artifacts or something that come into play, okay, if those are a story element that you're putting into play, go nuts, make something crazy, you know, have a good time yeah. with it. Just and have again, a way to it's... get it back out if it becomes a problem, I guess is the I... only thing I would say. I think you just, I think what's important at the end of the day is just, again, it's about knowing your players. Mm-hmm. If you got a player who wants quirky, weird magic items, give them quirky, weird magic items. But don't mm-hmm. force quirky, weird magic items on the player who wants the stats. Like, mm-hmm. let them take the boring, mundane stats and let them enjoy what that does for how they built their character until they decide they don't enjoy that part anymore. And then mm-hmm. see if you can get them something fun and quirky, maybe. Like, you know, but don't don't have them build a, a giant crit build and then not give them the stats to make the crit build function. Like, mm-hmm. let them play in the ballpark for what they're shooting for, and then and then uh, you know, the person playing the the quirky druid who likes fun magic items like me, give me all the fun magic items you can, because mm-hmm. my character's not really hitting anybody with them anyway. He's gonna use them as tools to get out of situations or something. So, mm-hmm. you know, that's it's it depends on your players. I think greatly what you give them. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I had it, something else, but I just blinked on it in my brain when you were finishing that sentence. So, we have another question. We have a, a few. Yeah. Uh, Let's so. Keep VTech uh, was asking, any advice on keeping notes mid-session? As a DM, I have a hard time keeping up with the players and taking notes. I can keep up with my players, no problem with RPing, combat, and sudden changes. But then I look down and I go, oh, shoot, that just happened. Uh, yeah, that is that is tricky. Uh, developing some kind of shorthand, maybe a tactic I would uh, suggest. Um, record yourself. Like in, in our case, we're streaming, so we can record it and we can rewatch it and take notes off of that. If you don't have that option, just take your phone out, record your audio uh, for a segment, and then you know you have that ready for a post game. You can go back and look at it, you know, to make sure you got your details right. Uh, but you know, generally speaking, if you do you do things in the moment, unless you got the uh, memory of a goldfish, which uh, sometimes I do, uh, you, you'll typically remember what just happened, right? So like you'll hold on right. to it just long enough till you get to a break or the end of the game wrap up or something. And then you, you furiously write your notes in as much detail as you can before you forget. If you're playing on Roll20, mm-hmm. you have a lot of really cool tools where you can literally keep a log of an overview of what happened that game. And I did that with Raining Bullets, where mm-hmm. I put that in story format. I do it with all of my current games because I type those things out in the Discord. You literally see me write what happened the last Horror and Huttenberg game that I ran off stream. I typed it out because I don't have that one on stream. So for me, typing out kind of an overview of what happened helps keep me remembering what's going on. What I'm worse about is combat tracking. That's a whole different level set of notes. So I put I put like little symbols and I try to be consistent on the tokens to reflect different things. And I track health levels on the tokens so I can see them and I know where they're at with all those kinds of things. Like for me, that's 
that's the harder tracking for me than than game to game notes. And we do have the I do go back and watch all of my game sessions now to make sure I didn't miss anything when I'm writing the next segment or working on the next game. I do go back and watch all of mine now. But if you don't have that luxury because you're not streaming, and you're not recording yourself, um, writing it out as soon as you can after the end of a session usually goes a long way because that's when you're the freshest and you remember the most. Yep. Uh, one thing I did for the Exalted game I ran is every, oh, I was using Roll20. So I have that as a kind of a place to put everything. But every single NPC that I introduced, I had a, a, a picture for it. And then I wrote down where the players met them, what their first interaction was like. And then each time they ran into that character, I would add a little tab and just write what they, they did that the players remembered. And then any session notes I had about that NPC, I wrote down the GM notes. And so like I had this long thing where like the player's like, oh, I forgot who that NPC is. You just literally click on the NPC, they pull up the notes, they're right there. Uh, and some of that's in the prep. So like uh, I prepped a lot of NPCs, like the, the GM side of things, what I knew about them, what was gonna be important uh, for the story and all that kind of stuff. It's all in that spot. So I know where to look for it later. Uh, but for the uh, the player notes, and like the interaction notes, that was something I just kind of typed up like right after the session. You know, if anything was like really notable, I'd, I'd write a quick little like shorthand kind of note and then I'd go back and flesh it back out later. And it's really yeah. useful. If you do that enough, uh, it saves you a big headache in the long haul. And, uh, and I think it's really useful for your players too. I, I did my best to never stop mid combat. Yeah, yeah, mid combat yes. ending is brutal. I I do my best to to you know never never go never go to bed in combat. Just finish it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> even even if you even if you have to make the bad guys all run away and leave them all stay there, wonder what just happened. Like never stop mid combat. This is the worst for me. Well, I mean, so. if you are going to stop mid combat, obviously snapshot your initiative roster, figure out whose right. turn it was. Yep, and get like a recap of what the last round was like each action for the last round and then write those things down as best you can remember the next session you pop back in you've got all the status effects all ready to go you've got like hit points where they were just just write them down at the end you know save your state essentially if you're on roll 20 the thing's already going to be there so like you don't have to worry about that but if you're if you're on a table yeah. situation you're writing down notes by hand um Chances are you're you're tracking it on a piece of paper somewhere anyway. Like if you're like me, you know, you got hit points, you've been scratching off and stuff. Just get in the habit of labeling things so that when you come back to it later, you know what the hell you're looking at. <laughs> another another great fantastic tool you can use for tracking between game sessions is just ask the players. Yeah, what do you guys remember? I just come back and like, hey, what do you guys remember from last game? I do this for my off stream one all the time. I'll, for for Hunt, right? hey, what did you guys do last game? They'll think about it for a minute. And then they'll spit out a bunch of stuff. And every once in a while, they'll say something like, oh, yeah, that did happen. <laughs> I mean, I wrote down almost everything else, but you're right. I completely forgot that part of it. So then yeah. like, I have to make myself a note you know, like, and, and work that back in because they remembered it. So it was important to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's... There may be things that happened last game that I forgot that they both forgot. And then it didn't matter because they didn't remember it. And I don't remember it. So and that's the no extremely important call thing. We've talked about this in the past. They're like... Yeah. I love the idea of having players recap the previous session and like maybe do that on like a rotating basis uh, because it, it immediately tells you what they, they picked up on, what they focused on, what they forgot, what they didn't care about enough to actually remember. And it tells you what pieces of your descriptions they latched onto. So you understand more about the psychology of your players and what motivates them in game. And I don't know, it, it's kind of hard to do like all players for the same game session, right? Like what do you guys all remember? There's gonna be a lot of overlap. Um, but at the end of the day, the only things that matter, like Dustin was saying, is what they gravitated towards. Unless if you got a, a prolific note taker there, VTAC, that's the person you have just do your recap. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they, did, they did the work for you. It's yeah. that simple. <laughs> yeah, have that prolific note taker. Uh, if it, actually I should find out, are you using like Roll20? Because if you are, just give them a journal, like a handout. Yeah. And if they're writing everything down, just make it accessible to everybody, including yourself. And then you just go in there and you read the damn thing. Yeah, <laughs> you, they're doing all the work for you. Give yeah. them a group journal. That note taker will be the only one who uses it. We'll call him Tim. 
and he will write everything out in there. And the other players and you as a GM could just read it later. Be like, yeah, look at Tim. He did a great job taking all the notes because that's what Tim does for us. A lot of times he's that guy who takes down all the notes. (laughs) So we're really (laughs) going to chance this here. I'm going to see if I can open this up without blowing up the stream. I want to pull up the notes I was doing in my exalted game. Just kind of show you what I was doing. You're going to put them on screen. I might. Uh, I'm going to try this. We're going to see if I can find it first. We we joke. Tim Tim is the Tim is our local TT2KB scribe. He will he will write down all the loot, all the notes. I don't do those things most of the time. I'm lucky if I remember my own character's level. I you know it's just <laughs> it's facts. It's not me. I'm just here to role play. I'm here to role play, and occasionally you know. And his name is Tim, so it works. But yes, yeah, some mm-hmm. call him Tim. Some call him Fulcrum. Let's Some call see. him Ryak. All right, let's, uh, let's see. Can I add this? Keep talking. So while you're, Justin, while you're looking, I'm going to go ahead and fill the next question. We're going to keep this train moving while Jeff's trying to find this here. So I'm going to go here in the dashboard so I can look at the questions and see where we're at in our activity feed. Um, oh, we got that one. Uh, yep, we got Debbie's question. I think we got them all. Uh, how do you add balance and creative items? We did that one. Oh uh, yeah, I think we're caught up. Okay. I think we are caught up. So, um, yep, I would say as far as that goes, if you have a player who does those things for you, just don't duplicate. I guess a big thing for me is just don't duplicate processes. Mm-hmm. Um, if you you've got someone time. who's doing that part for you and helping you out, don't look a gift horse in the mouth. Use it. Like mm-hmm. the creative group, yeah, use those. Use that technology. Don't don't make it harder than it has to be. So. What's going on? We got ladies love Irby. Ladies love Irby. We are fielding questions about your tabletop role playing game questions, knowledge, anything you need to know. If you have problems at your table, this is our next to last episode of the Wisdom Check, a podcast that me and Jeff have been doing for over two years. Mm-hmm. And we're bringing her down because we got some new shows we're going to be rolling out in 2021. And you'll get to hear about them here in about 10 minutes. We get near the end of the show tonight, <laughs> unless we run over. If everyone's still got a bunch of questions, we might go late a little bit, but. We'll see how things are going. Um, oh, now don't cry, Death Angel Shadow. You're going to like what we got next because you're going to be able to be more interactive with it than even you've been on this show. So that's right. You're going to, yeah. it's going to be a lot of fun. I think once everybody is, uh, gets used to the idea, I think that the people who partake will have a good time. All right. So I've got, I've got something here. I'm about to flip it around. I'm going to make sure I don't screw this up. Let's put that up there. Do that and let's transition. Okay. So you should be looking at, I've got this stolen piece of art here and, uh, you know, my character that they ran into. Oh yeah. There you go. Uh, so we'll slide down here and, uh, you'll see what game session things happen. And then I literally just wrote down who they interacted with, what they overheard, uh, what the relationships were like, did they react well or poorly to the NPC? Uh, you know, did they argue with them? Is there some kind of tension I need to pay attention to? Uh, so that's all there. And I just went down and did that completely for that particular NPC. Uh, let's see, there's another one maybe that's got some more. Uh, like this one here. Classic. So like this guy, he had a ton of notes about him. And so you can see, I just, every, every time they ran into him, I made a new section and uh, tracked whatever was going on with him. And again, the, the real emphasis was like what their interactions were with the players and what the, the players took from those experiences. And then, of course, I had my own session notes down below hidden in the GM notes. So I, I think for me, because my games are typically not long, super long campaign formats, I don't take quite as detailed notes because most of the interactions I keep relatively in my head. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think like Horan Huttenberg. I didn't have to list what your guys' reactions and responses were to meeting uh, Halford Davidson or Alexi Arkwright. Like, mm-hmm. I think it was pretty obvious, um, you know, what your relationship was with him after he blasted his daughter with a blunderbuss <laughs> and stabbed her to death. Like, was, you know, when those yeah. things happened, like it was, I didn't have to write that down. Like, I kind of remember, you know, and then, then a whole bunch of other things changed and then you end up working with them anyway. So, you know, it was a, <laughs> there was a, there was a lot of back and forth in there. I didn't, I didn't write all of it down necessarily, but, um, again, it's just what your 
what you're using the NPCs for and what you need to know about them. Mm-hmm. Uh, if it's something that you, they are, they're going away and they may not come back for five or six games to meet that NPC again, then you may need more detailed notes. Mm-hmm. If you're not coming back again at all, then who cares? Yeah. And so, yeah, it, notes should reflect their need. And, uh, right. you know, minimalism is good. I, I think it, the, the more streamlined and consistent you can get, the more minimal you could be. And then everything is better. <laughs> like, so right. I would just sit down and come up with a system. You know, come up with the ways that you label things, the way you describe things. Um, form you know, good habits. Format it somehow in a way that is consistent for you. And then from there on, it's going to be way easier. You form, you form good habits. Um, mm-hmm. They say this a lot in football. Like we run like fumble drills. And you think of a fumble as something that's chaotic. The ball bounces any direction, you know, this, that, the other. But what football coaches will tell you is, is that you make your own luck. And you make your own luck by forming really good habits. And then no matter which way the ball goes, if you're if you have those good habits and those instincts kick in, you will react appropriately and you, it will seem as though you have good luck. But the truth is, is you you have prepped yourself for those situations. And when those situations occur, you fall back on good habits. So exactly. and that, that's where I joke about sometimes when we try to do dungeon crawly things like my group, like when we did DCC tournament. I'm like my group. I'm like, we do not have good habits for dungeon crawls. We have horrible habits. Like, you yeah, know, it was a, it was an act. Stuff. It was it was some act of some god that that we made it through there, like we did. But <laughs> <laughs> we 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 don't have good habits, like at all, when it comes to that stuff. So, you know, I was. Those are those are those are things in your games. Like I said, if you you create good habits, you will fall back on them when they're needed. If you don't <laughs> have good habits, then you're flying by the seat of your pants and hope you get through it. Yeah, that's right, VTech. Sorry about your luck there. You know, the Jets have not practiced good habits. Um. Yeah, they got MLG. it this week, but they, but they got it this week. <laughs> can't, can't talk about them this week, though. Other Animal G, how do you TT to the TK or to the KP? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I, I can't even say it apparently. So there's that. Um, yeah, so that kind of is winding us down here. We got like three minutes left of our official time. Uh, for those of you who are joining us now that maybe haven't been here for the whole time, what we're doing right now is uh, taking people's questions of things that have come up in their tabletop role playing experience that they would like our two cents on, whether it's, you know, asking advice on how to do something, uh, working them through developing a process. Um, did we answer Big Tiger Man's question? I, Here we go. I'll, I'll look for it, Jeff. Keep talking. Yeah. So anyway, uh, if you are interested in asking a question, this is a good time. Um, I know I can go a oh, little late. I don't it. know if Dustin can, but uh I, I got to work at 3 a.m., so I can either go really, really late or not at all. Those okay. Choices. Well, <laughs> well, we'll probably wrap it up relatively soon then. So if you do have a um, question, sneak it in. Big Big Tiger Man, he he didn't redeem it, but I found it in the chat. Would you recommend taking one level dip into Sorcerer or Wizard if you're a cleric rock and spirit guardians to pick up shield and absorb elements? Mm. That's a very technical question. No. And... <laughs> Generally, um, I would say no. Uh, I, I'm trying to remember how 5th edition does multi-class spell casting, but in most editions of Dungeons & Dragons, dipping spell caster levels and going away from a full loadout, like a full single-class uh, magic user, is usually a mistake. Yep. You set all your Thank spell you, progression Robert. back you know, you know, a couple levels. Uh, usually you don't pick up anything particularly useful out of it, uh, I would look for a feat that maybe gets you the ability to dip a couple spells or an item, uh, something along those lines, rather than kind of dipping into classes that don't really synergize well. I I, I think I agree with you because the true answer is, is you should dip one level into fighter. Everything gets better with that. <laughs> yeah. This is my, my common 5e thing is, is if you don't have one level of fighter, you probably did it wrong. But mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> Fifth edition does a few things differently, but like, if you're looking at old editions or like Pathfinder as an example, uh, there were good ways to multi-class, and then there were really bad ways to multi-class. And depending on how you did it, you know, you either crippled your character or made them legendary. I, I think Five E is far more forgiving. Like, if you did it, it's probably not going to ruin your character mechanically. It just may yeah. not benefit you as much as you want to. So I would, I would say, I, I probably would not, but. Um, that's, I mean, if you want to go the route, I mean, the other question, the other question always comes with absorb elements for me is just how often are you going to absorb that element? Like, is it's it even worth it? Rather strong, actually. Because it I is, think, but 
I think it's a reaction, and you get to activate it whenever you get hit. And so then it just automatically types to the one you need. So that's pretty potent. Um, I would say, I think there is a cleric domain, though, that actually gives you uh, absorb element. I don't think it gives you shield, but I think it gives you. Uh, there's a few that give you absorb elements, so you may want to look at that route so that you can stay single classed. Um, yeah, and, and if you're I already past the point of making that decision, because they have to make the decision level one, don't they, as a cleric? Yeah, so, and I think uh, if you're looking at, uh, I, I, I guess, what's the motivation? Are you just specifically looking to get two spells that are not on your list, or are you trying to do some like kind of story element that is making sense here? Uh, I'm guessing not. Just, this sounds like a mechanical question purely. And because you're looking at the mechanics of this, the spells that you said, if I, if I remember, you said shield and absorb, neither of those require a stat. So like you're not dealing with, do I have a high intelligence to cast a spell? So the dip isn't going to be too bad because uh, you're not picking up things you're not going to be skilled at. So I don't know. I, I yeah, don't know that it's going to work. That's the Shadow's putting it out there, I think, correctly. And... Uh, is is demonstrating very well why dipping into another spell level class does not help you and why you should just dip fighter instead. <laughs> yeah, I, I would simply just find <laughs> alternate routes to get that. Uh, and remember, you got a party, right? So, like, chances are, if you're the cleric, somebody's the wizard, right? So, likely somebody else is going to have one of those spells that they can apply. Or to sorcerer, you. if not a wizard, a sorcerer, or a something, a lore bard, or a something. So. Yeah. Yeah, just remember that at the end of the day, uh, as much as we may come up with concepts in our head that are like the James Bond character that goes in by themselves and is suave and does everything, has like every skill you need at the right time, that's not how games yeah. go. You're a party, you have something that you're good at, you have a lot of things you're not good at, and you have other people in your party that are there to fill those gaps. And you're not going to run into the scenes where you need to have every single tool. And you really shouldn't try to be that character. It's just not as fun. Yeah, um, but if you're going to, it's a druid. Yeah, the druid is freaking <laughs> I mean, But if you're going to, druid's probably yeah. it. I mean, I'm not, yeah. I have not been disappointed with my tool selection since I started playing one. I'm not going to lie. It's, it's pretty nice. Yeah, and if you're wanting spell versatility, uh, yeah, Mouse is right. Uh, the bard is where it's at. Lore bard is yeah, freaking bard is crazy good. Uh, in 5th yeah. edition, anyway. Uh, yeah. So the last ch question I see up here before we uh, run out of time, Mouse Spears saying, how can I be motivated to use all the cool tools I actually have, but never use to make a cool game? <laughs> oh, but man. What cool tools are you talking about, Malice? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I guess uh, motivation is always an issue, right? Uh, so like the same tricks that help you get motivated to do anything are going to apply here. Uh, Small, uh, like I would take whatever your task is, break it down into small chunks. Uh, if you have new tools that you want to utilize, just pick the easiest one, the smallest one, and come up with some excuse to use it and make it simple that you can get done in like one sitting. And then just throw it out there and then try it out, see what it, what it does. Uh, really, the, the answer for me whenever I run into that kind of stuff is just simply just force yourself to do it. And then once you do it, you're good to go. You'll, you'll form a habit. I, I know for me, my motivation comes from the energy of my players. Mm. And I have had very little problem. And maybe this is, again, maybe this is the secret in the sauce for me. But since coming on a stream and running games, like, you know, I, right before we started streaming, I ran uh, Raining Bullets with you guys. And that game went, you know, 10, 11 sessions. It went really well. It ended. I come back on here and I run Terran Tree Fell and I got six new players. And then mm -hmm. I do Horror and Huttenberg and I got five different players. And then I got Vigilantes of Valandry and I got six different players than the other groups. So like for me, mixing it up and having new people at the table for me helps keep me motivated because then mm -hmm. they come in fresh with a bunch of energy and they're excited and they want to do this. And so that I feed off of that energy. Um, you know, I don't I don't feel like I'm I'm dealing with players that are dealing with burnout, so I'm not burned out. So mm -hmm. now I'm going to do Ike Indrid, and I got my group back that I haven't DM for since Raining Bullets, you know, three years ago. <laughs> so, yeah, so you know, I got, already. yeah, wow. I mean, so you know, uh, that being the case, like you know, they're they're super excited for Vampire because we're switching kind of systems up, so it's a little different. 
And so for me, switching systems up and, and that keeps helps keep me motivated doing different stuff and keeps me mm-hmm. churning along. So that's how I keep my motivations. Yeah. And I think chat's kind of playing with what we put down earlier. Uh, and I, I agree. I think the trick is literally just pick one thing, try it, do it. You don't have to have full system mastery. You don't have to have the entirety of World Anvil learned, uh, you know, right off the start. Just put something out there that you can you can try out, see how it works. If you like it, focus more on it. If you don't, figure out why you don't like it, making it, you know, adapt. And then maybe once you've done that, try a different one. Uh, it's just small steps, you know. Make it easy. I know. I know for me, like, and this is again. This is just a, me as a person. <laughs> like, I have to put twist on things. I have to spice things up. Like, mm-hmm. my stories are always delving into gray area, like I mentioned earlier. But like for me, it's it's a I got I have to constantly be kind of spicing things up. So, uh, part of what's worked really well for me with my modules I've been writing for Zweihander and running a second group through them is that they're making different choices. Mm-hmm. And so the story stays relatively kind of the same, but with different choices, like it, it becomes very different. And the angles that they're taking it are different than what your group did in Horn Huttenberg. So I'm already going to get some different results. It's going to be cool oh, to see sure. that play out. So I'm, I'm already down for it. It's already not the same game, you know? So <laughs> yeah, for me, that's, that's, that's where it's at is, is seeing those different things come out each time. Yeah. Uh, Malice, you were saying that uh, you're of two minds. Uh, you're either the perfectionist or the I got a case of the fuckets. Yeah, um, yeah, I, I know that that feeling very uh, very well. And I mean, we've talked about it a lot. The the reality is, you've got to be patient with yourself. You've got to allow yourself to fuck up. Uh, you've got to allow yourself to put out a good product and not a perfect product, because uh, otherwise, it'll never happen. Yeah. So perfection is the enemy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I would say that applies to a lot of people in our group, uh, you know, won't take the, the chance of trying a game because it's not going to be perfect the first time. You just got to try it and give yourself the, I don't know, give yourself the permission to make errors. It's going to happen. So just allow I, it to happen. I don't even consider myself that good of a writer or that good of a GM, but I fucking do it. It gets done and everyone seems to like it. So mm-hmm. I must be doing all right. But I still, even now you'd be like, are you a good writer to us? And I'm like, I'm not that good of a writer. Like I'm really not. Yeah. I, I would say, I mean, everyone I know who does this stuff, I have feeling struggles with it, uh, struggles with confidence in some way or another, unless you're like, you know, one of those people who's just crazy over self-confident. But uh, I mean, if somebody's honest about their feelings about things, I think everyone's got some anxiety about these things. And everyone is a, their worst critic, right? You got to yeah. remember if you're if you're digging at your own stuff, your players are not going to be that upset. <laughs> like, you're the biggest asshole that you can you can run into is basically what I'm trying to get at. And uh, yeah, you just got to shut sure. yourself down a little bit. <laughs> and, and if there's one thing that I make up for, if if I have a lack of writing talent and a lack of GMing skill, which I admit totally I do, I make up for it with completely just the world's largest battery of constantly moving forward. I don't, Mm. I don't stop and I just keep moving forward and I just do shit. And it's just, it just is what it is. I just push those things forward and I just see where they end up at and I just push them till they're done. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So whatever they end up as they end up as, but I, I see it through to completion and I I don't typically start a lot of things I don't finish. So Mm -hmm. even Uh, if it's not good. (laughs) <laughs> last redemption we got here before we got to wrap up uh yep. earlier saying uh that she's asked the group if they would play in a module that she would dm and half the group has said they would so far so hopefully it goes well still nervous to fumble over myself but this is good advice uh yeah it's that's the way it is uh just go out there and play do it just run a game if you're running a module just make sure you've done your homework read through it make sure you're confident and um you know, at least the the bare bones information that's in there. Uh, if there are weird mechanics that you need to deal with, go ahead and read up on those. And then once you get in the game, just treat it like you're the you're a player. Like you go in there, you're there to have fun. You know what you're doing. You know your stuff. And if you don't, you can look it up. It's not a big deal. And just if it's a written module, it. you're the only one who knows the truth. <laughs> yeah. Until they read it later. 
yeah. So yeah, it, good luck with that. Uh, I would just, I would, I would look forward to it. It's going to be a good experience for you. And I think, uh, you know, if you if you're playing with your friends, your friends are going to take care of you. So let's go in there and have a good time. Yeah. So uh, that wraps us up, I guess. Um, next week is going to be our final episode, as we kind of alluded to here, of the Wisdom Check. So we're wrapping it up. Uh, it's been quite a long experience. Uh, we have been going for almost like almost two years. At this point. The season finale. It's the series finale. Mm-hmm. So we're gonna have to we're gonna do a little wrap up on the next uh, episode. So uh, we'll come in. We'll kind of celebrate the show we'll talk about things that we've kind of experienced uh you know if you guys got anything you want to share you can bring it up then um and then that'll kind of usher us into the next uh next year where we're going to be bringing out some new shows and uh, that's right those so i'm pretty excited about that i'm looking forward to what we got going on and uh who knows maybe the wisdom check will make an appearance once in a blue moon like the uh the mcrib (laughs) if we get some good questions um so in terms of our schedule, uh, what do we need to talk about this week? We've got, of course, well, go ahead. I, I was going to say, so tonight's Monday, and that's when we do the wisdom check one more time. And we just told you what you can look forward to next week. Tomorrow, being a Tuesday, we have our, well, I'm going to use the word artist because it is kind of a, a talent. I guess talent's the word we've been using talent for Talent Tuesday. Tuesday. We're calling them Talent Tuesdays. And... 8 p.m. Central Time. Cameron will be kicking off with probably more Bardic Knowledge. Mm-hmm. And that runs for about two hours to 10 p.m. And then he hands the, the mic and the reins over to our DM, Levi, for DM to Art, where I believe uh, Cameron is working on some vampire-inspired music, or at least he was. I don't know if he has finished that track yet. I have not made it all the way through the last Bardic Knowledge. I started on it last night, but did, did not get all the way through it because I want to hear him making the music. That some good you stuff. See in my I Kindred game coming up soon, <laughs> and then at the same time, Levi has been working on art for Sid. Mm-hmm. Last time I saw him, he's working on boots, boots and oh, pants, yeah. and boots and pants. And pants and boots. So that'll be tomorrow night. You'll probably get to see more of both of them. That brings us to Wednesday, where you will get to join me Wednesday night for another under the influence game prep session, where we're going to be playing a little game called "Do You Want to Build a Vampire?" and we're <laughs> going to start. Get your get your frozen voices out. Um, we're going to be building some vampires who may or may not be the sires of some people who've given me character concepts. Mm. If you haven't given me a character concept yet, you're one of my players. Better get on it before Wednesday because <laughs> we're going to be making vampires. So those of you who haven't seen a full-fledged World of Darkness um, vampire sheet created from scratch, we'll be making a few of them. Nice. That'll be good. Thursday night, video game night. Mm-hmm. Um uh, it's Christmas Eve. Yeah, I don't think we're going to be right. I don't like think anybody. anything's probably happening Thursday night. I'm working. In, in the off chance and, that there is something, it'll probably be me uh, playing some video game bored out of my mind. So uh, I will let you know on Thursday if I'm going to be running something. And if Le- I am, Levi stuck at Magic last week. I have a feeling he may not be sucking at Magic this week. <laughs> He'll probably be doing doing what every parent's doing on Christmas Eve, if I had to guess. So um, I would I would suggest you might see Jeff. Um, you you might see me uh, if I get out of work early enough. But I think I'll be doing the same things. So you can't see it because my green screen's blocking it. But there's wrapping paper and stuff back here. I got all work to do too. Mm-hmm. So um, you know, just look forward to that. Um, Friday is Christmas, so Merry Christmas, everyone. Merry Christmas, if you're, everyone. If you're those who celebrate, be, be as safe as you can in this time that we live in. If you're if you're forced to have to see family and friends in the very way that you're seeing us right now, just be, be glad that you have that. And this isn't 100 years ago where you just literally yeah. would just not have seen anyone. That's true. So is, is it however bad we have it, when the Spanish flu pandemic hit, they had none of this sort of stuff to keep in touch. And letters took weeks to get places. So hearing from people was, was, you know, at least we have all of this um, for, for what it's worth and how much has it sucked. We have it better than many others have had it. So just to yep. uh, keep your heads up, enjoy the holiday as best you can. And then Saturday, this coming Saturday, it is up in the air. Weather ever storm will return. I am. <laughs> It'll return at some I, point, but. Everstorm is going to return. We had a last minute cancellation last Saturday. Levi kind of wanted to bump it to this Saturday, but I'm not positive that it's going to happen. 
that's we'll not see. finalized yet, though. So we're still looking into whether Saturday will be the next episode of Everstorm or not. If not, it'll bump to the new year, most likely. Um, Clearly, you'll have to join the Discord if you're not there and pay attention yeah. for announcements. So uh, go check that out. However, something that is happening, Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. Sunday, Sunday, 5 Sunday. 5 p.m. Central Time. We're going to be doing episode two for A Bitter Harvest, and that should take us all the way. F- uh, they, they just reached Vorberg. Nice. They, they, they discovered the wreckage on the road. They discovered that they believe it's mutants that are responsible. And they're going to figure out what they got to do next. So uh, Debbie Snacks there, Miles Conspiracy, Purdy But Nerdy, who was in here earlier, and uh, our buddy Georgie will all be back this week with me to finish up, hopefully finish up, A Bitter Harvest this coming Sunday. No party has survived it intact yet that I have run it. We will see if they are at first. Um, we'll, we'll see how it goes. It'll be it'll be interesting. It's always interesting when people get to to the big sort of plot twist to how they handle it. So mm-hmm. they they should get there this coming game. And then uh, we got a lot of people asking about the new shows. Yes, uh, so we, we should go through a rundown. Bit. That would be a good that would be a good time for a rundown. So kick us off, Jeff, with what the new Monday show will be here in place of the wisdom check. All right. So Monday we are going to be doing a show called All Aboard, and that's going to be about board games. And uh, Dustin and I are avid players of some board games. We, we, we used to play a lot of uh, games. Very few people played with us after a while because we're just so damn good. Uh, and so we wanted to extend it out to the bigger community. So what we're looking to do is we're going to be using Tabletop Simulator. And uh, we will be bringing out whatever game we can come with. And uh, we're going to go have some fun. And hopefully you all will be joining us. Uh, so we're going to be keeping track of things in the Discord, figure out who's going to be up for playing something on the stream. And each week, we're going to bring some of you in. We're going to play some board game, and we're going to have a good time. So uh, that's that's one of the shows we're going to be doing. And then on who, Thursday, we're going to be... Who's looking. better? MLG wants, who's better at what? Yeah, it depends on the game. That kind of <laughs> depends on the game. Like... <laughs> I, I, I ain't too proud to say that Jeff was better than me at Masters of Orion when we played it on the computer. But yeah, there's that. Yeah. But there were a few who there were a few who could match me at Settlers of Catan. So we, we put up some epic games at Settlers of Catan between the two of us. That's true. Uh, it'll be fun. We'll we'll see who can uh, take us on. But uh, yeah, Thursdays we'll be doing another game night, and that night is going to be more focused on video games. And we're going to be calling that one Looking for a Group. And much like the Monday night game, this is going to be another chance for the community to come play games with Dustin and I and some of the other guys if they want to play as well. And uh, those games we're going to do are going to be more party related. So we're going to be doing like Jackbox. We're going to be doing like Among Us. uh, Anything that's like a group activity where everyone can kind of participate and have a good time. So we're just going to drum it up, get you guys involved, and uh, share some good times with you all. We we have absolutely loved how how consistent and interactive many of you in the chat have been during wisdom check, redeeming mm-hmm. questions, uh, you know, uh, firing out, you know, your own anecdotes of things that you've dealt with to answer other people's questions, things like that throughout our shows, um, getting involved in the Kickstarters for guests we've had on here and everything else. You guys have always been a very interactive crowd throughout the oh, two years. Absolutely. we've done Wisdom check. We want to be able to take that to the next level. We want to be able to invite you now, not just to hang out with us while we do something or talk about something that we love or whatever, but, Definitely bring you guys in to be able to come sit at a seat and play a board game with us on a Monday mm-hmm. for and it's set aside, you know, two to three hours to do that. And that's what we're looking at maybe being able to do. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm excited for that. I think that I'm pretty excited. larger, larger group games like Among Us or Jackbox, you know, on on mm-hmm. Thursdays, it's going to make that hell of fun because, <laughs> you know, you can hop in and out between rounds. We can get a lot more people, a lot more of you involved with us more directly mm-hmm. as opposed to just being viewers. And on top of that, we still have Don't Sleep every other Wednesday. Mm-hmm. And what I think is probably going to happen is, is I'm going to be starting I Kindred on the opposite Wednesdays and it's going to be more chat involved. Not as much as Don't Sleep, perhaps. Um, but somewhere <laughs> between Hander and Don't Sleep is what I'm shooting for with chat involvement in that game. Right. But um, it'll it'll definitely have that, and I'll probably be moving my GM prep sessions to 
the opposite Sundays of my Zweihander campaign. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Unless unless I'm cast in the cyberpunk game for Featherfall Tabletop, which may happen. So Ooh, we'll see. Nice. I, I might have a seat. Uh, you might be able to find me over there soon. Um, I still got to talk with the guys over there about uh, with that starting up and get my new work schedule figured out. So, yes. uh, but D GM prep will be moving from Wednesday to another day of the week. Maybe I'll do it on Fridays on my Fridays off or something. If I don't have anything else going on, but I'll figure that out. And uh, you'll be able to find me at some point in time doing GM prep still. So kick ass. So uh, definitely be on the lookout for that. Um, if you're on the discord and you are intrigued by these new ideas, uh, I'll make a new section for each of those shows and uh, start putting in that you're interested. And if you have any particular board games that you're interested in or particular party games that we can play on Thursday that you're interested in, toss it out there. Let us know. Right. We're here to understand what you're up to. And if you don't give us something, we're going to pick something we're going to do. Step. And you just have to deal with that. So <laughs> step, step one to get in the seat at the table is to be in the discord. Amen. And I'll, I'll link that one more time. Um, so we got that. We got our YouTube channel. Make sure you go check that out. If you haven't subscribed to it, please go do that. Uh, you are going to get all of our past broadcasts of the Wisdom Check, uh, all of our episodes of the um, Everstorm, all the episodes of Dustin's uh, Zweihander stuff, a lot of episodes of DM to Art and uh, Bardic Knowledge, uh, all the episodes of Don't Sleep, like all kinds of stuff on there. So if you right. want to catch up, you want to go back and relive some times, it's all on there. Uh, it's there for you, so go check it out. And uh, who knows, maybe we'll start making some new content specifically for YouTube this year. I know we've been talking a little bit about that. So uh, all that, I think we got everything except for the last announcement, which is to go support artist David Lee Pancake. Check out his store, check out his Patreon, check out his YouTube, check out his Twitch. All the links are there for you. You know you like gigantic dragons. And I happen to know this week is Christmas, right? So if you That's are right. one of those people who are a last minute shopper, and you've been thinking, God, it's COVID time. How the hell am I going to deal with this? I can't go to the mall. Well, we got you covered. Go to his website. Go order yourself a kick-ass dragon and have it delivered. And we'll get it to your, your family. We'll make sure they have a great time. Hell yeah. Oh, yeah. So that's my plug. <laughs> All right. So uh, I was doing a little scouting here. What? And I found us a raid target. Awesome. So we are going to go bother Gathering of Nerds. Oh, sweet. We've raided them before. If you've been here before, you'll recognize them. And we're going to go bother them because they're playing Vampire the Masquerade. Oh, so kick ass. When Very you get cool. there, if you got fangs, show them. <laughs> Tell them TT2KB sent you from the Wisdom Check. Nice. And go catch a little vampire action. We will catch you guys after the holiday. Enjoy. Thanks, everyone. Good night.